All right. Well, it's 10.02. And, um, you know, I'm sure that people will be joining uh, as we go along. But um, maybe we should start with a round of introductions soon, uh, you know, just so we can see who's here. And, um, yeah, we don't... Um, really expect everyone to be right on time, but that's okay. And then, um, you know, by getting the ball rolling, we can hopefully stay on schedule and, um, you know, respect people's time and keep from going too long. Uh, so, yeah, I think for introductions, uh, basically if we could just go around and if you want to say your name, where you're from, your preferred pronouns, um, but you can also put in your bio, any uh, position that you may hold in the Green Party, um, you know, or, or very quickly just, you know, have you been involved with the party before or, you know, is this your first time getting involved and, um, you know, what, just very briefly, um, what your involvement has been. And um, so why don't we try to, you know, keep these intros to a minute or less. Um, so I'll, I'll start and then I'll just uh, start calling on people so that we can, you know, keep things moving. Uh, so I'm Dave Schwab. Uh, I'm, I'm in Madison, he, him. I am a co-chair of the Wisconsin Green Party. I'm also involved in the Four Lakes Green Party. I've you know, worked on a number of campaigns in Wisconsin and across the country. Um, I'm also involved in the you know, Green Party US as a national committee delegate, member of the platform committee, media committee. Um, yeah, so I've been involved with the Green Party for a while in various ways and um, looking forward to this meeting. So um, I'll just go down the list. Um, let's see, uh, Samuel or Sam Chance is next. Go ahead, go right ahead. Sure, um, I'm Sam, I'm from Madison. I, uh, I'm the uh, representative for um, Congressional District 2. Um, I co-chair the IT uh, committee as well as the platform and policy committee. Um, I'm an alternate on uh, for the national committee. Um, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, if I didn't say that already, I uh, think that's all I've got to say. Um, Melissa, would you like to go next? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's Melissa. Um, is Melissa's audio cutting out for anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Melissa's frozen for me. Okay. Uh, Melissa, it seems like you might be uh, muted or frozen. Okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good Great. I don't know what gremlins, I guess. Um, sh should I just start over? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Melissa Minkoff. I'm from Madison. My pronouns are she, her. I've been involved with the Green Party for a number of years. I am... Uh, an at-large representative on the coordinating council. I am a uh, national committee alternate. I am one of the co-chairs for the IT committee, and I also serve on the communications committee and the platform and policy committee. Great, thanks, Melissa. Um, okay, Jeffries. All right, uh, I'm Jeff Reese, uh, living in Fond du Lac, um, and um, 
you know, 20, 25 years I've been up here now. Um, you know, I have been kind of dormant with the Green Party. Oh, uh, pronouns he, him. Um, been somewhat dormant, but I think after the latest elections, um, goodness, I think we need to we need to strengthen the Green Party. So I think that uh, now it's important to stay with it. Um, would like to be active again, but I don't know. The last year or so, I've been just uh, pretty much apolitical. I still vote, but not happy. So decided to join everybody this morning and see if uh, we can come up with some solutions. Um, and I'll pass. Thanks, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Next up is Barbie Milwaukee. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Barb Eisenberg. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I live in the Great River West in Mo neighborhood in Milwaukee. I've uh, been involved with the Greens since 2000. Um, and I am the treasurer for the Greater Milwaukee Green Party. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, next is Ben Lee. Yeah, there, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, this is my first time voting green was this past uh, election. So that's pretty fun. My little baby boy. So, uh, yeah, just checking it out. Awesome. Welcome. Thanks. Um, so cute baby too. Uh, <laughs> Bill? Bill Bryan, Milwaukee. I'm um, state treasurer. I've been an active socialist for over 50 years, including as a green, an eco-socialist green. Glad to be here. Thanks, Bill. Greg? Hi everyone, I'm Greg Banks, um, co-chair of Greater Milwaukee Green Party. And I've been involved with the Greens since the 80s um, in many different roles. Um, great to be here. Thanks for putting this together, everybody. Thanks, Greg. ZB? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Nathan ZB Kingfisher, and I've been active in the Green Party since the millennia with Nader and Leduc campaign. And um, I am the retiring Northern co-chair of the Wisconsin Green Party. And I, uh, my, my pronouns are uh, he and him. And my political leanings is toward the eco socialism. And uh, thank you, everybody, for your time and uh, attendance. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Barbara? Hi, everyone. I'm Barbara Dahlgren. I'm from uh, West Alice here by Milwaukee. I'm the uh, elections chair right now and also the secretary of the Wisconsin Green Party. And I also serve locally in elections in Milwaukee. Um, good to be here. And I also have Tom here with me. So if Tom wants to also introduce himself while he's getting set up. Uh, hi, yeah, Tom, I'm from uh, Bayview area in Milwaukee and yeah, I'm just setting up. I'm on the IT committee, uh, been in the Greens for uh, on and off since about 2017 or so uh, past. Thanks, Barb and Tom. Okay, and um, 
a new person just joined, uh, James Bankard. Uh, James, we're just doing a round of introductions. So if you want to just briefly let us know your name, um, where you're from, preferred pronouns, um, you know, have you been involved with the Green Party before? Um, and if, you know, in, in what ways, or is this kind of your first time getting involved? Um, and yeah, uh, so go ahead, James. Uh, my name is James Bencard. I live in Madison. Um, I um, traditionally vote third party. I, um, I'm starting to get more involved with the national organization, which is World Beyond War, uh, trying to build some life behind the anti-war movement here. So we've had some rallies and leafleting and so forth around the Capitol. But I'm looking to um, um, gather some more uh, support for that. And um, so I'll be reaching out to various organizations. I'm happy to um, contribute to what the Green Party has going on. Um, I was supportive of Matthew Ho's uh, candidacy in North Carolina, um, voted for Cheryl uh, for uh, the um, the election. I think it was uh, what, Secretary, what was she up for, Cheryl? I can't remember. Secretary of State. Secretary of State, yeah. So I support um, those candidacies and think that um, the Green Party just needs more, just like any third party needs more uh, people. So, um, and I'll be happy to contribute as, and uh, uh, like I said, and, and I, I have that other organization that I'm looking to build uh, momentum for as well, because I, I don't believe in this proxy war in Ukraine and don't think that the Democrats uh, are putting uh, up a fight in order to stop it. Great, thank you. Yeah, World Beyond War, great organization. So thanks for joining us. Um, I also, um, I worked on Matt Ho's campaign. So glad to hear you supported him too. Um, Matt is great. All right, so um, great. It's exactly 1015. And, um, you know, I think probably more people will continue to join. Uh, that's usually the pattern with these relatively early starts, but, um, you know, we'll just get going and hopefully uh, folks can go with the flow as they join. Um, for now, we're on schedule, so let's try to stick with that. Okay, so, again, welcome everyone. It's great to see you all. Um, I, you know, again, I'm Dave. Um, one of our uh, co-chairs. Uh, so, um, you know, I'll be co-facilitating the meeting today. Um, and I'll also be, uh, you know, making some introductory remarks and giving a presentation a little bit later on proportional rank choice voting, which I'm excited about. Um, my first time presenting on the topic, but uh, yeah, I think it'll be good. So I am just going to put um, a, a link in the chat again to today's agenda so people can have it in front of them. And I guess if there are any you know, questions about the agenda um, or anything like that, you know, it's just good to have it in front of everyone. Um, and you know, typically the way that we do things uh, for folks who are not familiar is we use a stack system. Uh, so if someone wants to speak, then uh, they should get on stack. Um, the best way to do that is to write in the chat the word stack. Um, and that lets us know that uh, you have something to say. And so then Facilitators will uh, call on people who are on stack, um, you know, mostly in the order that uh, they uh, that they raise their hand, so to speak. But but don't 
raise your hand or don't use the raise hand function because that just makes it more complicated. Please just write the word stack. Um, we'll call on you. And we'll also try to prioritize people um, who haven't spoken as much. So, um, yeah, we today we'll mostly be having discussions. Um, if we do make any decisions, then we strive for consensus, which basically means that um, everyone is in general agreement and there are no objections that are so strong that, um, you know, that someone does not want the decision to move forward, uh, which we call unresolved concerns. Um, you know, if there is disagreement on a decision to be made and not all concerns are resolved, then we can move to a vote. And in that case, um, we need 60% of yes votes to, uh, to make a decision. But um, typically the way that we've been doing things um, in recent meetings is we don't make a lot of decisions on the day of. It's more that we um, will discuss issues and then uh, we'll send out electronic ballots to all of our dues paying members in good standing and you know, people will have a couple of days to vote on things like officers and proposed amendments to the platform and proposed changes to the bylaws. Um, speaking of which, um, to vote, everyone should be a dues paying member in good standing. And um, you know, if there are questions about what that means, then um, you know, be glad to address it, but if, uh, if someone could share the, uh, the link to our contribute page in the chat, um, you know, basically it just means that people are uh, contributing to the party. It's a, it's a sliding scale type membership based on, um, you know, ability to pay. And, um, you know, we have a dues paying membership model because we don't take any corporate money. Um, you know, we don't get money from millionaires and billionaires. Um, you know, this is a party that is uh, run largely by volunteers and supported by working class people. Um, so they say nobody's going to fund our revolution but ourselves. Um, so, yeah, I think that covers most of the housekeeping announcements, um, unless there's any Anything that I missed or, or any questions? Um, test, I just want to test my, <clears throat> my sound. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, we have this new um, Jabra speaker thing, so we're just testing it. Um, all right, uh, pass. Okay. All right, so... Um, all right, so why don't I um, go into a co-chair report, which um, you know, I'd like to kind of focus on the political situation that we're in. And, you know, we're almost two years into the Biden presidency. Uh, we just went through an election season where, you know, voters are angry, dispirited, and very fearful. Um, I think the climate of fear uh, seems to keep growing. Um, we've got record inflation causing economic pain for working people. The U.S. is pouring billions of dollars into the war in Ukraine that threatens to mushroom at any moment. Uh, just the other day, um, there was another scare of possible world war. Um, another request for almost $40 billion for Ukraine. Uh, while working people in the U.S. are, uh, you know, left to fend for themselves. Uh, climate crisis continues to accelerate rapidly. Uh, we're seeing devastating events like Hurricane Ian, um, you know, non-survival weather events, basically, uh, unless you get out of there as fast as you can. Uh, Record-crushing heat waves, wildfires, floods, and droughts. Uh, 
Seattle recently had the worst air quality in the world due to the wildfires that are uh, just constantly raging in the West. Um, the Republicans run on anger and disappointment with Democrats. The Democrats run on fear of Republicans. Neither corporate party offers anything close to real solutions. Um, so the Republicans have cynically gamed the system of lifetime appointments to pack the Supreme Court. They've managed to overturn Roe v. Wade. And Democrats have not codified Roe in 50 years, despite numerous opportunities to do so, and claims that they would do so. And they say they'd like to protect reproductive rights, but they can't because of the filibuster or whatever today's excuse is. And the same goes for protecting voting rights. And, you know, they say they'd like to raise the minimum wage, which now is worth less than it was at 5.15 an hour in 2007 due to inflation. Um, but they say, oh, the parliamentarian won't let us do it. And that's kind of a new one. We, <laughs> um, so the Democrats always have excuses and rotating villains to explain why they won't do what they told voters they would do. Um, and now they've lost the, the House of Representatives. Uh, so, um, you know, as, as former Democrat operative Peter Dow has pointed out, Democrats are delighted with this result because now they have a good excuse for not doing anything. And, you know, most of them got to keep their cushy jobs. Um, so the Democrats Inflation Reduction Act doesn't appear to have done anything to reduce inflation. It did include some subsidies for green technology, but this is just part of the same old all of the above energy policy. Since the bill also required massive expansion of fossil fuel leases over the coming decade. So we saw mainstream climate groups celebrate the IRA as the best we could get from Joe Manchin. But meanwhile, grassroots environmental justice organizations called it a climate suicide pact. We also had a massive racial justice uprising, which the Democrats rode to victory in 2020. And instead of delivering criminal justice reform, they turned right around and told us what we need is more funding for police. So on issues from crime to immigration to the economy to foreign policy, Democrats react to Republican fear mongering by caving to their narratives and copying their policies. And on the few issues where Democrats stand up to the right, their resistance mostly takes the form of virtue signaling, not actual policy to help the people. So one of the few bright spots of Biden's presidency so far is his recent move to cancel up to $10,000 of student loan debt per borrower and it's pretty amazing for us to remember that when Dr. Jill Stein became the first presidential candidate to call for cancellation of student debt in 2016, the idea was roundly dismissed and mocked by liberals like John Oliver, who did a, an entire show about how crazy this was. Um, and just a few years later, the, the demand has grown strong enough to force Biden into action. Now, there's some people now who are saying, well, Biden timed it just before the election and used shaky legal authority, knowing that this was likely to get struck down by the courts after the election. And that's entirely possible. You know, he could have done this much sooner. Um, and, you know, now it's, it's even an open question whether this is going to help people or whether it was just another political move. Um, so the Democrats, you know, did face a reckoning from voters hurt by inflation and other economic woes, although the Republican alternative was so unpalatable that they didn't lose that badly. But they still won't offer stimulus to working people saying that it could worsen inflation. Meanwhile, in Germany, they have skyrocketing energy prices due to the war in Ukraine with a cost of living crisis. And the National Governing Coalition, led by Social Democrats and Greens, gave people direct subsidies to help pay their energy bills, impose price controls, and windfall taxes on energy prices. The next big state election, the Social Democrats and Greens actually increased their vote shares. So voters actually like policies that help them in their everyday lives. And 
in many countries, the governing parties actually win midterm elections because they do things that help the people. In systems with proportional representation, voters could feel free to express their discontent with the poor performance of the center-right Democrats by voting for a progressive left party. The current economic, social, and environmental crises created by the corporate parties could lead to a broad leftward shift. In the US two-party system, what we get instead is angry voters looking to punish Democrats by voting Republican, and the Democrats respond by moving further right. This dynamic has allowed both parties to move far to the right, and while the Democrats exploit justified fear of Republican extremists, they do little to fight the right and much to enable it. So many left-leaning voters have justified continued support of the Democratic Party as a harm reduction strategy to prevent Republicans from taking control and making things worse. But when the Democrats do win, their fecklessness and corruption usually results in a Republican comeback shortly afterwards. The overall effect is not to defeat the right, but to enable it while preventing the rise of a truly progressive left party that could effectively fight the right and advance popular policies that people want to need. So the two-party system's manufactured climate of constant fear makes things difficult for the Green Party. Yet we do have opportunities to make forward progress. Recent polls show over 60% of US adults believe the two-party system does such a poor job representing the people that we need a new party. Millions of voters, especially young people, are looking for a viable party to challenge the duopoly. The movement for ranked choice voting and proportional representation is gaining ground. Ranked choice voting won eight out of 10 uh, referendums in November, some of them by overwhelming margins. And two cities, Portland, Oregon and Portland, Maine, passed measures for proportional ranked choice voting, uh, which we'll talk about more later because that's a very exciting development. Uh, we also see countless races that go on uncontested by one of the corporate parties, which gives a lot of space for Greens to run. In fact, just two years after kicking the Green Party off the ballot, the Democrats didn't even run candidates for Congress in two of Wisconsin's eight congressional districts. There's no easy fix to the problems that we face, but our historic task and responsibility is to figure out how to transform the dismal political situation in what is still the world's most powerful country and to build a bridge from the world we have to the better world we know is possible. So, um, yeah, uh, that's my take on the current political situation. Um, so, uh, Joe Nathan, if, uh, would you like to make a, a, a report as the, uh, as, uh, outgoing co-chair? Um, I, I got five minutes or something. So, uh, you can hear me good. Yes. All right. Let me, uh, just let this rip and start this right. And hopefully I can do it right. and inspiration Dave and uh, I agree with you totally and um, you know I just want uh, a word a word you know one of the things from uh, Native America Native American Indian perspective is there's incredible diversity incredible diversity people say well what about Indian stuff well how can you say anything about an opinion when there's three to nine million people with different opinions so that's a good start and what I do know is that way back in history, there was incredible diversity that coexisted and a great respect for diversity. And um, 
there was a particular publication 150 years ago when the 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 Bureau of Indian Affairs from the War Department um, confiscated it and, you know, was setting up a reservation. This publication said that uh, there, th that uh, translation, Gitche Manadu, Great Spirit, was never said before. There were other names and every name was respected. And so, um, I just want to thank the great creators in, in our dictionary from Minnesota, from that area. The, the creator uh, is pluralizable. It's multiple. There are infinite infinities. And um, yeah, that respect and kindness go way back. So whether people want to think about the earth as a mother or a father and think of the sky as a mother or father or however a field of particle lines however you want to science or indigenously relate um there is a great respect for diversity and that is the original american um, native american indian uh tolerance and respect for diversity everybody gets hurt and that is the essence of the talking circle where the person who holds the feather can be respected and can safely say what they need to say. So uh, to the virtual talking circle, I really appreciate everybody's perspective and everybody's participation. And um, I, I look forward to the, the many talents you all bring. Thank you so much for voting green and being green and go green, vote green. Thank you everybody. Thanks, Joe Nathan. Yeah, I've been um, very happy. You know, this my birthday was earlier this week, and I don't think I've ever seen such a stretch of snowy days in November, which is nice. Um, so, all right. Next up, we have um, reports. So uh, after the co-chair reports, um, we have committee reports um, from elections, membership, finance, communications, platform policy, and IT. So I'll just let committee chairs volunteer to go in, um, in whatever order they like. I could go first. Go ahead, Bill. Melissa or Sam, if you could screen share the financial report, I would appreciate that. Okay. <clears throat> Our state party finances are in reasonably good shape with about $15,000 in the bank. We had two major expenses um, this year, that is in addition to our uh, routine administrative expenses. First of all, we spent nearly $4,000 um, on petitioning and related campaign expenses to, to regain our state ballot status. And I think everyone will agree that was money very well spent. We also had $1,200 in bookkeeping expenses. Now this is a new expenditure, the result of the campaign treasurer position uh, remaining vacant. Uh, the state campaign finance reporting that's done every um, few months is being done by our former state campaign treasurer at $100 a month. We've had some discussions on the coordinating council about how we might rein in some expenses, in particular, the cost of our membership data server, Nation Builder, as well as looking at the bookkeeping expense. So we will be taking some steps to address the, these issues soon. 
Concerning income, all of our income comes from our members, dues and donations, especially dues. Dues collections were a little off this year compared to last, and that can make um, a big difference. What is uh, especially important for the stability of our finances is the monthly online dues contributions that um, so many of you you give to the organization. It's really our, our lifeline. So we would encourage everyone to pay their dues. It's really the best way to keep us solvent and prepared to meet opportunities for growth. And that concludes my report, Dave. If anybody has any questions about specific things on the um, on the uh, sheet before you, I will address those. Great. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Uh, does, uh, are there any questions? Okay. Yeah, well, thanks again. Um, okay, so uh, are there any other um, committees that would like to report next? Uh, I can I can go um, next with um, policy and platform. Um, sure. So, uh, so turn my camera on. So, um, as uh, the members of the party can see um, in our newsletter, uh, there are seven um, proposals which have been generated to mirror the proposals um, which passed at the national level. Um, so we do have um, a slate of, uh, of proposals um, and expansions to our platform, um, which uh, we look forward to getting um, input from membership on. Um, besides that, um, we've had uh, internal discussions about um, the situation in Ukraine um, and whether or not to um, endorse statements which have been put out by the national party um, or whether or not um, to put out our own statement. Um, we did uh, opt to endorse um, statements from the national party on that topic. Um, and I'd say that those are uh, some of the major items to report for the last uh, six months with um, policy and platform. Pass. Great, thank you. Okay, um, I know that IT committee has made some progress since our, uh, our last state meeting. So could we get a, um, you know, a brief report on the website upgrade and, uh, you know, anything else that you've been working on? Yeah, Dave, I can do that. Um, so as we uh, shared in the newsletter and probably some visitors of the website have noticed one of the big things that the IT committee, uh, the larger projects we took on this year was updating the look of the website, which we um, successfully did that earlier this year. Um, and so there's been some very exciting uh, visual changes to our website. Um, and as, as well as uh, we, um, launched a new logo for our state party, which we um, created uh, three logos and let our members choose by voting for which logo they preferred. And so we really appreciate the input from our members on that. 
Um, and so I think those are the two major points that we have to report. And we, uh, again, just thank the membership for all of the input on the um, the logo project and um, hope that you'll come check out the new website and um, use it often. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. I can record it. Okay, you, uh, you've got some feedback going on. Um, you want to try again? Uh, let's uh, try let's again. Try. Okay, we're still getting the feedback. Um, so um, maybe try muting other speakers or yeah. microphones or something. Can you hear me? Yeah, she can, they can hear you. They can, you can hear me? But you might want to direct your voice over to this, the mics over here, Bert. Okay, I can't hear anybody else though. We can hear. Uh... Okay, cool. So um, the elections committee uh, ever since the spring has been single-minded in um, making sure that our Secretary of State candidate, Cheryl McFarland, got on the ballot and did the best that she could um, through this very, very tough election season. Um, she, uh, just a, sorry, just a second, Barb. So we're seeing Tom's computer and hearing you kind of in the background. Do you want to maybe go over to Tom's device? Sure. To make the report? <laughs> I think that'll be better. Amazing. I'm seeing myself in different angles and it's very strange. <laughs> okay, well, now we see you great. We hear you great. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, yes, the elections committee has been pretty much single minded in making sure that Cheryl McFarland uh, got on the ballot for Secretary of State. She got over 1%. In fact, um, over 2% in some counties. Uh, Ashland's. You guys were rock stars up there. Thank you, Joe Nathan. Um, there were several other major cities that she got over 2% of the vote. Um, and overall, she got about 1.6% of the vote. So um, just with our small group and, and the little that we were able to do without millions of dollars and, um, you know, the political machine that the duopoly has, people were really looking out for us and over 40,000 people came out to vote for Cheryl. And those were just initial numbers. I haven't even gotten to like look county by county yet to see exactly how many people in every county voted for Cheryl. So that is major for us. And that means that in 2024, uh, we will be considered an established party. And that comes with a few perks, including a lot easier path to getting our presidential candidate on the ballot um, than we have had in the past. Um, some of you might remember that in 2020, uh, we were challenged um, when we tried to get Howie Hawkins on the ballot and the uh, Bipartisan Election Commission, all of the Democrats said, we're not going to accept your signatures. Too bad, so sad. Take it up with the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court threw us off the ballot. Um, the Elections Commission threw us off and the um, Supreme Court upheld it. So this year, getting on the ballot and getting um, that uh, huge number of votes like that, it's a major step forward for this party. And I'm hoping that we can use that energy and continue to build off it for the next um, election year. Um, so in 2023, the upcoming year, it's kind of a sleepy year for the most part because we don't have any big fall elections. The spring elections are the local ones. So you'll have your... Um, You'll have your school board, some of those little town um, and board trustee uh, elections, 
but there are also some vacancies. Milwaukee City Council has three vacancies that it's going to be trying to fill. Actually, my alderman just decided to move out to the East Coast all of a sudden. So that seat mm. is just randomly open. Um, so we're mm. definitely looking for candidates for the spring already. Um, December is petitioning time. We have December 1st to I think it's January 3rd or 4th. It's usually that first Monday in January um, or first Tuesday in January to get any petition signatures in depending on uh, what kind of race and how many signatures that you need to get for it. So um, just because it's a, a supposed off year, that doesn't mean that the elections committee has nothing to do. There's definitely races that we need to prepare for. Um, and we're looking for candidates for sure. Uh, there's also the Conservation Congress, and I always like to put that out. Um, we have this uh, publicly funded lobby in Wisconsin that no other state in the union has. And this lobby has elected people from the public come and uh, be part of that lobby. And some of what they uh, put out as advisory questions that can be um, and that can end up in the state legislature. It can end up being DNR policy for our um, environmental policy in Wisconsin. So um, it's a really good way to get in on the ground for, um, it's, it's a pretty low stakes political position. Uh, I'm part of the Conservation Congress, although I'm not gonna um, go into a whole lot of detail about uh, all of the different policies that they have. Um, because whenever somebody says I'm I'm on the Conservation Congress, you're really supposed to talk about what the Congress position is. Um, I'm speaking as um, a Green Party member, not as the Conservation Congress member when I'm talking today about how we can quickly get a bunch of people on the Congress. There's sometimes a lot of appointments. I think this spring they're finally going back after three years of um, weird pandemic policy to having elections. So um, they have elections in every county and those are pretty quick and easy elections to get people onto this board. Um, we also are looking for people to help write advisory questions that can become legislation and policy in the state. We're also looking for people who um, in all their various counties can enter those policies into their spring hearing, which happens every April, um, because each person can enter two, uh, um, two advisory questions. And um, if you have advisory questions across multiple counties being entered, those get a lot more um, interest from the Congress than if one little county, one little person from one little county enters an idea and then it kind of just gets lost in committee without a whole bunch of um, argument, even if it's um, if it passes that that county. So that's another um, political avenue that we have been taking and we can quickly and easily with some of these positions turn Wisconsin a lot greener than it is. It does take some work, but it is uh, feasible, I think. And we've done very well with local elections in the past. We just need uh, a lot more people and a lot more energy into uh, those local elections as well. So um, with that, I think I'll pass unless there's any questions for me, um, how to join the elections committee, definitely uh, shoot me an email, text me, call me, um, just let me know. And we've got a lot coming up, um, including we, we do want to go over the election results for this fall election in the coming weeks, if anybody would like to be part of that little group and see exactly where our voters are so that we can be on the ground in those places and, and make sure that they have a chance to join us and um, become a much bigger green force in Wisconsin. Thanks. Great, thanks a lot, Barb. Um, yeah. So, um, 
Yeah. And regarding uh, our committees, you know, that's where work gets done in the party. And, um, you know, we could always use more help. So the elections committee uh, can definitely use more help. The, the membership committee, uh, we definitely need more people on and, you know, try to do more membership outreach and, and, you know, build up our ranks of, you know, dues paying members. Um, the communications committee, uh, platform policy, IT finance, um, you know, it's not a huge time commitment, but, uh, you know, every, uh, you know, all the time that people put into committees really helps to move us forward and get us more organized. Um, okay. So, uh, now, you know, national committee reports. So we have, um, our four, uh, national committee delegates and alternates here, including myself, uh, Mike McAllister, Sam Chance, and Melissa Minkoff. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of activity on the national committee since the spring gathering, but, um, you know, we can try to kind of summarize and hit some highlights. Um, and my son may be getting noisy in the background. So <laughs> if you hear crazy sounds, then, the, then um, that's normal around here. So, um, you know, one big thing that we've been doing this year is uh, the uh, platform amendment process. So um, a number of platform amendments have, have gone up for votes. Most have passed. Um, five... I, I believe it was five uh, from the Wisconsin Green Party were all passed. Uh, so that's great news. There was one that was accidentally left out of the voting process that we submitted, um, which is now uh, has been added um, on universal child care. But our amendments passed on community control of police, uh, four day work week with expanded vacation time, um, uh, legalizing psilocybin mushrooms and other entheogenic substances, um, and also uh, rewriting of, of language regarding uh, population and you know, reducing uh, anthropogenic pressures on ecosystems. Um, so, yeah, thanks to the Wisconsin Green Party for, you know, making a uh, big improvement to the Green Party platform this year. Um, we uh, also have, um, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to remember the, the timeline here. Um, I know that we... Uh, well, why don't I why don't I pass it um, over to uh, to Mike, Sam, and Melissa while I sort of gather my notes on um, what happened when? Okay, uh, I can go. Uh, I just have a couple of things to say since uh, the. Uh, <clears throat> um, didn't prepare a, a formal report, uh, but one of the other things that uh, the the party ratified in uh, in the platform uh, was basically uh, incorporating uh, Howie Hawkins's uh, Eco Socialist Green New Deal uh, that he campaigned on uh, in uh, 2020. Uh, that is now a formal part of our, our platform. And uh, that's that's really exciting because it gives us something uh, uh, very <clears throat> concrete that we can continue to take to voters uh, at all levels <clears throat> uh, in the coming years. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, that's it. That's all. I'm really excited about that.
Okay, yeah. I, oh, go ahead, Sam. Yeah, um, I can also um, speak a little bit to some of our um, some internal updates within the national committee team in terms of how we um, are doing, uh, how we're increasing reporting to um, the coordinating council, and hopefully um, soon we can uh, expand that out to the membership. Um, basically providing information on each proposal um, and seeking input um, on those. So, um, you know, the National Committee delegates are interested in input from our membership on all of these issues, uh, and we want to make that information um, available to the membership so that they can let us know what they're thinking. I'll pass. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Yeah, so um, a few other uh, sort of highlights, and people can find, you know, the uh, the results of national committee votes and the text of proposals um, on our uh, gp.org website. It's a little bit of an obscure URL, but um, you know the, the info is all there. I'll just highlight a few that may be particularly interesting to people. Um, so we did uh, endorse a Green Party Peace Action Committee statement on the war in Ukraine, which basically, you know, affirms the Green Party stance that we oppose um, sending more weapons and military e aid to fuel the conflict. Um, and, you know, that we believe the, the U.S. needs to... Um, you know, engage in, in diplomacy and negotiations to end the war as, as soon as possible, rather than, um, you know, trying to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. Um, uh, another Wisconsin Green Party uh, platform amendment that passed uh, was uh, supporting lowering the voting age to 16. Um, so we also passed a... Um, a platform amendment to recognize that so-called gender critical feminism and related concepts like the sex-based women's right declaration are not recognized by the Green Party as radical inclusive feminism and doesn't meet with the 10 key values or our platform, um, you know, stating that trans rights are human rights and not in conflict with women's rights. So, um, there was a proposal to accredit a Green Party Elders Caucus, but that failed um, due to concerns with the, with the process of trying to organize that caucus. It, it's a little complicated to summarize now, but um, there were um, elections for three new steering committee positions as well as the treasurer. So, that's four out of nine members of the steering committee. Um, and also the Green Party uh, voted to withdraw from the Federation of Green Parties of the Americas um, due to basically concerns that that body was being manipulated by, um, you know, by more right-wing uh, delegates and that the you know, the Green Party U.S. and other uh, more left-leaning Green Parties of the Americas were being, uh, you know, basically silenced and marginalized. Um, so basically there were concerns over how democratic it actually was. And we decided that without um, really having influence in the body, um, you know, the, the best way to... Uh, to change it would be to leave and try to organize something new. So, um, you know, definitely some big changes. Uh, and yeah, like I said, if anyone is interested in kind of getting the full details, um, there's a lot of interesting stuff with the platform changes. Um, and our, our platform plank on universal childcare will still be voted on within the next month or so. Um, 
but yeah, so that, that info is all available on the website and, um, you know, if people have any questions, let us know. Uh, Sam, go ahead. Yeah. So I wanted to just add something, um, to the, um, to the portion about, uh, the Green Party of the United States leaving the Federation of Green Parties of the Americas. Um, one of the reasons why I personally supported that decision was because the um, FPVA, that's the acronym for it, um, they, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They they banned members of their organization from organizing with other political organizations outside of themselves and outside of the Greens generally. Um, I don't think that's how we're going to grow on any level um, by just being totally insular, only being willing to work um, with other um, parties or organizations which uh, have, I guess, the official stamp of approval of um, the, the Green Party of the Americas or just the global green movement in general uh, pass. So the ideas Next down. come together. All right. So um, without me, which is nice. All right. So that takes care of a national committee report. Uh, so next up are local chapter reports. Um, so why don't we start with the Greater Milwaukee Green Party? What? First time I voted green. I can share my screen. Well, this guy seems new. It works. Everyone see that? Yep. So, Greater Milwaukee Green Party Chapter Report. It's been an exciting time for our local since the spring gathering. We had a local candidate, Cheryl McFarland, running for Secretary of State. So, a large portion of our labor forces efforts have been centered on this campaign. We've done canvassing, web design, including lots of work on online donation facilitation, meetings, in-person events by Cheryl and campaign literature development, just to name some of the work. We're also working with coalition partners on a public utility option and union organizing efforts. Uh, that particular uh, coalition partner is Democratic Socialists of America. Climate change and that partner is 350 Milwaukee Fridays for the Future. Housing, and that partner is Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign led by Sherry Honkala. International Justice, and that partner is Cuba Blockade Resistance of Milwaukee. International Peace Initiatives, and we have a few partners there, Peace Action, Friends Committee on National Legislation and End the Wars, and Line 3 and Line 5 Pipeline Resistance. And we worked with uh, indigenous people-led groups on that. Fundraising and membership development work have proven challenging this year because of our workforce issues, largely falling by the wayside. Our members have also been working on education efforts around 5G health concerns, net neutrality problems nationally, and getting the lead out of our locals' water. We're keeping the local up to speed on some green uh, way initiatives in the local area interacting with the city county task force on climate and economic equity, reporting on press freedom through connections immersed in the Julian Assange debacle, participating in state and national representation and specific jobs for the party as people have reported on already, working on team building, representing the green initiatives on the Wisconsin Conservation Congress through election and meetings, supporting our social media presence, including our website, and supporting the local women's rights efforts. Uh, so please join us and get your activist needs met. Thanks. I'll pass and stop sharing. Great. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. Took a screenshot of that. Appreciate it very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so uh, who would like to uh, 
to start off the Four Lakes Green Party local chapter report. I can um, I can go. I have a few points uh, to discuss. Um, so um, over this past uh, six months period, six month period. Um, the Four Lakes Greens have been involved in organizing and supporting protests around the basing of F-35s um, in, in Truex Field uh, in Madison, um, as well as uh, PFAS contamination, which is partially due to that and the use of um, hydrophobic uh, firefighting foams. Um, but it's it's also related to just virtually everything um, as is a reflection of our uh, how our economy works and you know everything that we do sort of ha seems to have these um, deleterious outcomes for the health of the planet and 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 people and animals that live upon it um, you know, we've also been um, active in terms of um, organizing against the escalation of uh, hostilities uh, in Ukraine, encouraging negotiations uh, on that topic, um, and just really trying to avoid a uh, nuclear war that uh, will surely make our lives uh, much more difficult for the brief amount of time that they might last under those circumstances. Um, but on a more positive note, um, tomorrow uh, the Four Legs Greens are involved, um, have been involved in organizing a event for local candidates. Essentially, um, it's an event which we've organized with other um, leftist political organizations in Madison, um, Progressive Dane, and um, the Madison DSA, um, which as far as um, chapters of the DSA is seemingly more, um, they're, they're looking for, for a different spot to, uh, to cast their votes um, and run their candidates because the Democrats are not really um, doing it for them. Um, so we're working with those groups. Um, the purpose of the event is to um, both encourage and educate leftist candidates um, to run for office, um, let them know what is involved in that process, um, give them the tools um, to do so, um, both in terms of being a candidate, but also um, auxiliary um, campaign roles like campaign manager, campaign treasurer. Um, and uh, in that context, um, pitch those groups on um, working with us, running um, with the Green Party, um, which, you know, I think is 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 encouraging um if we can get some strong candidates to run with us um with that i'll i'll pass to either uh dave or melissa if um either if you have any comments yeah thanks sam so i'm just sharing a link to the um to sunday's events that's tomorrow um, it will just be, you know, a short info session for people who are thinking of running for local office or, uh, you know, who are interested in getting involved, even if they're not thinking of running themselves. Um, and yeah, so we are partnering with DSA Madison and Progressive Dane uh, on this, um, you know, both of which are, you know, basically progressive left. Uh, organizations that are, um, you know, independent of the corporate two party system. Um, yeah, so that's, that's exciting. And, uh, you know, kind of exploring, you know, further cooperation and, you know, potential coalition building with those groups. Um, yeah, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that folks would be welcome to attend, even if you're not in the Madison or Dane County area. 
Uh, I see Bill's on stack. Go ahead. I wonder if Mike could share um, a little with us about the interesting in initiative in Milwaukee that we're involved in with the uh, Democratic Socialists of America, the Power to the People campaign. Mike, I, I know you're not maybe prepared to give a report on it, but just update us. Uh, sure. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, Greater Milwaukee Greens have been uh, were were asked to be involved uh, in this campaign by the uh, Milwaukee DSA Psychosocialist Caucus uh, Working Group. Uh, it is an initiative to uh, have the city of Milwaukee seize. Uh, uh, to create a municipal uh, ele uh, uh, electric power company to replace uh, We Energies, which is uh, uh, obviously a, a major uh, fossil fuel uh, contributor uh, in southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, we are launching the campaign uh, in two weeks uh, of on December 3rd with a uh, town hall meeting uh, at the Washington Park Senior Center. Uh, we've had a, the usual uh, of difficulties. Uh, getting out all uh, get getting out all of the uh, material to uh, build that event, but I think it's starting to come together. We've got a flyer uh, a, a flyer produced, or at least will in the next day or so. Uh, we there's a uh, a, a Facebook uh, event posted and. Uh, I will try to find that uh, and post it here uh, later this morning. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're looking to try. We're uh, press releases going out this week. Uh, DSA uh, are uh, calling all of their all of their members locally to tell them about this thing. Uh, I should say that where where this uh, this came from. Uh, was DSA's door-to-door uh, -door orga uh, organizing in uh, River West and Bayview? Uh, where they go door-to-door -door and talk to people, and, and one of the things that kept coming up in their in, in their issues uh, was the question of high high utility rates and uh, and fossil fuels uh, from We Energies. And so some, uh, so there, there was like 250 people who signed up for more information about that particular uh, area. And so we start with that list and then, and we're hoping to turn out a uh, hundred folks uh, to this event on, uh, on December 3rd, which will also, there's a, uh, there will be uh, an online piece, uh, which I can let, uh, uh, so people can from the rest of the state can can join us. Uh, feel free to, uh, well, follow uh, follow the uh, Facebook event uh, for more information on that. Uh, things are proceeding. We're uh, cooperating pretty well, and uh, I'm really excited about the initiative myself. Pass. Great. Thank Great. you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, cool. Well, good to hear about a lot of community organizing going on. Um, all right. So that takes us to the end of our reports. Thanks, everyone, uh, for letting us know what's going on. Um, so we wanted to once more just quickly call for, you know, volunteers and organizers. Um, you know, if people are interested in organizing a local chapter or, you know, working with an, an existing local chapter, um, 
or, you know, if, if people are interested in volunteering for the party, you know, right now we especially could use help with our, um, you know, committees, as we mentioned, uh, you know, if, if someone can share the officers and committees page that has, uh, you know, more information about what the, uh, you know, what the different committees do, the elections, membership, finance, communications, platform and policy, IT committees. Um, and also this gathering is the deadline to self-nominate uh, for an officer position. We do have some officer positions open, uh, including uh, the you know, co-chair position that uh, Joe Nathan is vacating. Um, we have our uh, recording secretary and corresponding secretary positions. We have our operations treasurer and elections treasurer positions. Um, we have um, one uh, coordinating council representative in each congressional district. Uh, we also have uh, up to eight at-large coordinating council representatives. Um, and yeah, so, you know, all these positions really help us to get work done and build the party. Um, and yeah, so are there any other announcements before we, um, okay, I see that. Uh, Barbara Dahlgren will self-nominate for recording secretary again. And Bill Bryan is self-nominating for operations treasurer. Um, yeah. And also, um, yeah, I know that some people have already expressed interest. So when we get to the officer elections portion, then, uh, you know, everyone can share um, what they're self-nominating for. But okay, so I see uh, Barbara D has a few announcements. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over to, to her. And then, yeah, after announcements, we'll have a short break. Barb, we can't hear you. No, now. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Sweet. Um, so announcement one is that uh, we have a whole bunch of things coming up on our calendar. Uh, I just want to let you know that as secretary, um, we're trying to make sure that everybody um, has an understanding of when our committee meetings are, because even if you are not part of the committee yet, you can um, come into the meeting and kind of see what it's like if you want to. Um, so our elections committee always meets the first Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. Our platform committee meets um, the first Thursday of the month at 7 p.m. Our coordinating council meets the second um, Tuesday of the month at uh, 7.30 p.m. The Greater Milwaukee Green Party meets 10.30 to 12.30 on the first Monday of the month, except for this next time. Um, Saturday, not Monday. Saturday, sorry. <laughs> um, it's going to meet the second Saturday of this next month um, because of the fantastic event that we are having on the third. Uh, we also will be having our uh, coordinating council meet on the first, um, was it the first Sunday for our strategy planning session? Um, just of December. And um, our membership committee tends to meet 7 p.m. on the last Tuesday of the month. And if I'm missing any people who are on those committees, please fill those in um, so that people have an idea of when to make these meetings. If you have any questions about when these meetings are, you can also contact the committee chairs. Um, and I think that's good for that housekeeping thing. 
I also wanted to let people know that we have tons and tons of our old logo on green party buttons and t-shirts. So um, if we want, if people want those um, or any other flyers or merchandise uh, that I think that would go through the membership committee. Um, if you want, if you're interested in merchandise and um, the last thing I wanted to mention, uh, just get my notes here. Um, so there have been many Greens in Wisconsin who um, would, are very interested in the topic of health freedom and many Greens around the country interested in this topic of health freedom. And so we were thinking about um, having a Greens for Health Freedom sort of a committee or a caucus. And we found out that there is somebody named Chuck Fall in Oregon, Wisconsin, Oregon. on the national uh, committee, e Eugene, Oregon, Eugene, Oregon who uh, has started putting together a caucus called the Greens um, Green Liberation Society. So the Wisconsin Greens um, I would like to announce that um, I would love to help put together this caucus in Wisconsin. Um, if there are other members, we have a whole bunch so far who are interested in joining the Green Liberation Caucus of Wisconsin. If you're interested in sort of left libertarian ideals and a health freedom, this would be a good group to, um, to communicate with and um, I would be the contact for that. I can put my contact information in the chat. Um, with that, I think that's all of the announcements I have. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we can take a break and, but I just do want to clarify that, um, you know, the, the caucus that Barb mentioned is not, you know, that's, that's not something that the Wisconsin Green Party has endorsed, um, you know, so I guess that would be a, a, you know, tendency within the national party, um, but, you know, just to be clear that, yeah, that's not something that our state party has endorsed. So, um, all right. So why don't we take a break now and um, let's see. So oh, we actually had some pretty lively reports. So we are now officially behind schedule, which is okay. Um, but it's a five minute break. Sound good? And we can reconvene at 1130. It's good. Let's do that. Okay. Five minute break. Reconvene at 1130. Okay. It's 1130. Um, so next up on the agenda is hearing a discussion of platform amendments and bylaws changes proposals. Um, so why don't I turn this over to Sam, um, the Platform and Policy Committee, to uh, intro these items. Sure thing. Thanks, Dave. Um, so what I'm going to do is just do a screen share of our newsletter where we have all of the... Um, <laughs> all of the amendments listed out. So I'll get that going in just one second. All right, um, so I'll just um, generally intro um, the platform amendments by saying that these are proposals which were voted on by the National Committee of the Green Party United States. Um, all of these were approved by uh, the National Committee um, 
And so at the time that um, these are being developed, um, these had had been accepted. And that was the criteria for for their inclusion on the ballot this year for the Wisconsin Green Party. So um, without further ado, um, what I'd like to do is I'll just go through all the proposals. Um, I'll go through the platform proposals first, and then okay, um, and then we can, and then after I go through all of them, I'll bring out proposal one, and if there are any concerns, then we'll just go through each of them in that way, um, and then afterwards um, there is a bylaw um, amendment proposal as well, which. Um, we will also go over. So proposal one is to lower the voting age from 18 to 16. Um, functionally for us, it means changing language in our bylaws to support um, such politics. And uh, let me actually get everybody a link to the newsletter so that they can actually um dave would you be able to just post a link to the newsletter in the chat i don't want to be um switching screens too much and make christmas okay wow okay sorry about that um I do not know why this will, okay, there it goes. Um, okay, so the first um, bylaw amendment is lowered the voting age to 16. Um, as I said, it's changing this language in our bylaws. Um, and you can view um, more information on the proposal by following the link in our newsletter. Second proposal um, is to support um, inclusion in anti-discrimination laws of language which covers LGBT, LGBTQIA plus individuals. Um, you'll also notice that in this amendment, um, we clarify our position um, on gender critical or trans inclusionary um, theories of uh, feminism. Um, and, um, essentially we state that we are not in favor of, of those theories and we do not, um, consider them, um, examples of, of feminism. A third proposal is to legalize psilocybin mushrooms. So again, changing the language in our bylaws. Uh, the fourth proposal is community control of the police. So you can see that this discusses establishing community control boards of police, which oversee them and have um, powers to um, hire and fire officers and police chiefs. The fifth proposal um, is the establishment of a four day work week, four day work week with no cuts in pay at least a month of paid vacation per year. And the sixth platform um, amendment proposal is a livable income. So this is an expansion of existing language in our platform. Um, the existing language specifies a $15 per hour wage. Um, the new language um, specifies that um, a shorter work week, um, and that the living wage is indexed to um, inflation um, so as to make sure that we're not just establishing a certain dollar um, wage that will, in the near future or after an economic downturn, then be insufficient to um, support a person. 
Okay, so those are platform proposals. Um, so I'll go through and ask if anybody has any um, comments, concerns, or anything which they want to say about proposal one. Okay. I'm not seeing anybody um, in the chat um, or hearing anybody. So with that, I will move on to proposal number two. Does anybody have any comments um, or questions about this proposal? Okay, I'm uh, not, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not clear. Is this the, I think there was one in here talking about, oh, the, is this the trans exclusionary social theories proposal two? All um, right, proposal two. Yeah, anyhow, I'm not prepared to go through, go through this in detail, but just want to say that I do believe in women's sex-based rights and that to me, the Terps stand for that, and um, the proud Terps um, believe that a, you know a woman is an adult human female, and so that tends to be my belief. And I haven't read this in detail, but uh, I don't think my beliefs are consistent with this proposal. So I'm just letting you know <coughs> my position past. Thanks, Tom. Uh, looks like we have Bill on stack. Just to reiterate, um, if I understand it correctly, all of these uh, language changes were adopted by the national party and in many cases by very large margins. So I, I looked over all the proposals and I find them all um, supportable and um, I find uh, proposal two to be uh, very much in line with what is apparently the majority view of the Wisconsin Greens as well. Pass. Thanks, Bill. Um, and it looks like we also have Dave on stack. Yeah, um, I want to echo what Bill said, and you know, also point out that you know this is consistent with. Um, you know, decisions that Wisconsin Green Party has made, uh, you know, recently, and, um, you know, as well as the Four Lakes Green Party, um, you know, in, you know, standing with the, uh, the uh, Lavender Caucus, as well as the National Women's Caucus, and, you know, stating clearly that trans rights are human's rights, and are not in conflict with women's rights. Um, and, uh, you know, also, you know, that this platform amendment was overwhelmingly adopted by, uh, you know, the Green Party U.S. National Committee. Um, yeah, so I, I fully support this. I think we should pass it. Pass. Thanks, Dave. Um, and next is Melissa. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo what uh, Bill and Dave have pointed out that this language has already passed on the national level. It's passed by a really large margin. Um, I agree with it. And I think that we should pass uh, this proposal pass. Thanks, Melissa. Um, yeah. Um... I'll just say as well that um, this, all of these proposals, um, as Bill indicated, um, have passed with very large margins on the national level. Um, but uh, if there are any further comments on proposal two, um, I'm prepared to move forward to proposal three, which is the legalization of psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, are there any um, comments or questions regarding this proposal? Mm 
Okay. I'm not hearing any or seeing any um, posted in the chat. So I will move on to proposal number four, which is the community control of police. Um, are there any questions or concerns regarding this proposal? Okay. Could I say something, Sam? Go ahead. So the Camden, New Jersey um, model seems to be a really effective model um, for people that are speaking out in their communities about this issue. Um, they've had amazing success and it's well documented. So I don't have a link to it, but I just wanted to make that comment. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, any language that we vote on here can be expanded in the future. So if there's um, useful um, uh, actions or behaviors or policies from um, Camden, New Jersey, um, you know, I'd encourage you to do some research into those and then, um, you know, maybe draft proposal or um, come to one of our uh, policy and platform meetings and um, we can work together to to get that into our platform. Really appreciate the feedback. Um, are there any others um, who have um, comment on this proposal? All right, not seeing any. Um, so then we'll move on to proposal number five. Um, the four day work week. Are there any um, comments uh, or um, questions regarding this proposal? Okay, I'm not hearing or seeing any. Sounds like we could all use a day off from work uh, every week, so that's good. Well, not good right now, um, but in the future, hopefully. Um, and then finally, um, we have proposal number six, um, which is amending the livable income um, plank of our platform. Are there any um, questions or um, comments uh, regarding this proposal? All right, um, not hearing or seeing any. So um, with that, I will move ahead to the bylaw um, amendment proposal. So um, this proposal is amending our bylaws, um, which currently indicate that our meetings um, should be held uh, uh, essentially in a in a physical location. Um, member meetings should be held in different locations in Wisconsin. Um, and so uh, the proposal is to amend that to include provisions for online meetings. So instead of saying that they must be held in different locations, it indicates that they may be held online or in person, and if they're in person, then they still are held to the same um, expectations in terms of different locations. Um, and yeah, what I'll, I mean, what I'll say um, about this proposal is, this is how we've been operating um, for the, um, past two years, um, two and a half years, uh, maybe at this point. Um, it works well. Um, I think that it has um, benefits um, for accessibility. Um, and it also has benefits in terms of um, saving the party resources, uh, in-person events, um, if they're held in 
um, public spaces um, for hosting, those can incur expenses there. Um, by the nature of um, holding a event in one physical location um, without, you know, virtual accessibility, um, the further one lives from that location um, or difficulty accessing um, transportation options can create um, significant barriers. Um, with our virtual model, we're able to um, allow people um, online access as well as dial-in access. Um, so um, that I, I had noticed that there wasn't a background section for the proposal. So I was just providing a little bit of background. Um, with that, um, are there any um, comments or questions regarding this um, bylaws amendment proposal? I have a comment, Sam. Go ahead. So I, I see in the language it says either online or at locations in Wisconsin. Um, couldn't it say both, like hybrid? Um, it could. I, I don't think that actually changes the meaning, though. Uh, you know, I mean, it's like they can be held um, online or in person. Um, that doesn't uh, preclude one, you know, or doesn't preclude the the other option from also being explored. So that that would be my comment. Uh, Bill. Well, it, I think it should be recorded in the minutes of this meeting that the intent of the language here is um, and or, which would uh, accommodate uh, Greg's uh, concern about the understanding that we have that uh, uh, hybrid meetings are part of this formula of online or in person. Pass. Sure thing. Thanks, Bill. Um, point of clarification, is anybody taking minutes for this meeting? Uh, typically, that would be um, the role of the secretary. Pass. Um, Yes, there's going to be minutes, but uh, they'll be retroactively created. Okay. In the recordings. Thanks. Um, will you be sure just to make a note um, of um, Bill's comment regarding the and/or language? Yes. Thank you. Um. Are there um, any other um, questions or concerns regarding this proposal? Okay, I'm not seeing um, or hearing any. Uh, so with that, um, I think that we can conclude this portion of the agenda. All right. Thanks a lot, Sam. Okay, so um, next up on the agenda, uh, we have um, officer elections, nominations, and speeches, um, if, if people would like to make a speech. So we do um, in the chat have some people who have uh, self-nominated for positions. Um, we also do have, you know, previous records of people self-nominating for positions. So 
Um, I think at this point it would make sense to kind of go down the list and, um, you know, confirm what, uh, what the positions are and who is, who is self-nominating. Um, so first we have the co-chair position that's being vacated by uh, Joe Nathan. So, um, I, I mean, I, I think Joe Nathan was the um, party which nominated me for, for co-chair and I accepted that nomination. Yes, I was, and I really appreciate that you accept it. Thank you, Sam. Okay, great. Do we have any other self-nominations for co-chair? Okay, not hearing any. Uh, next up is operations treasurer. Uh, I believe Bill has um, expressed today and previously, he's self-nominating. Go ahead. Well, to the last point, we have two self-nominated for co-chairs, right? Dave and Sam, is that correct? No, um, my term is, is ongoing oh, okay. for another year. All right, thanks for clarifying that. Um, on the uh, treasurer position, in uh, the past, we've had uh, treasurers who were willing to assume the responsibilities for both of the treasurer positions, that is doing both the operations and the campaign uh, finance reporting. And um, I have been doing the uh, operations treasurer uh, position for I don't know if this is the, I think this is the fourth, the fourth term, but I'm, I'm a little unsure about that. Um, we had uh, a tre uh, the campaign treasurer position filled for uh, a couple of years. It's been empty. We've got that um, uh, covered by our bookkeeping um, arrangement that we've got in place, but we, we do have a long-term need to fill that campaign treasurer position. I, I just want to note that um, it's a job that involves um, state reporting. We had um, an individual who um, filled that position uh, a number of years ago who um, did not do a very good job. And it presented some problems with our, um, uh, our um, reporting to the state so um, if and when someone does step forward to assume the campaign treasurer responsibilities, they need to uh, realize that it's a, um, an important um, position that um, requires um, careful attention and um, you would need some training um, to do it. In the, in the interim, um, the work is being done. So uh, I... Uh, I accept the, uh, I, I'm prepared to uh, continue in the position unless someone else is. Beth. Thanks, Bill. Are there any other self nominations for operations treasurer? Thanks, Bill. Okay, not hearing any others. So next up is elections treasurer. You know, as, as Bill mentioned, the position is currently vacant. And, you know, so we have been paying a stipend to, um, you know, one of our former officers to, uh, you know, fill that role. Um, you know, it would certainly be a good thing to, uh, you know, have and, uh, you know, an active member in the role of elections treasurer. Um, and, you know, would also save us a substantial amount of money. Um, so, 
and um, you know, I don't want to speak for Bill, but I, you know, I think he has basically offered to, you know, provide guidance to anyone who uh, is willing to take that role. Um, so elections treasurer, are there any self nominations for elections treasurer? Okay, well, we'll leave that one open um, in the sense that anyone can speak up at any time if you would like to self nominate for elections treasurer. Recording secretary, I believe Barb Dahlgren has already um, self nominated, is that right? Yes. See a thumbs up. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Are there any other self nominations for recording secretary? Okay, not hearing any. Correspondence secretary. Any self nominations for correspondence secretary? We'll leave that one open for now. It's okay, National Committee Delegates. So just a quick rundown of how we've decided to do the National Committee election. Instead of having people run separately for delegates and alternates, um, all the candidates run together. The top vote getters are offered the position of national committee delegate first. Um, they can choose to accept that or they can choose to accept an alternate position if they would prefer. Um, after the, the delegate positions are filled, then the, um, you know, the next highest vote getters are offered the alternate positions, uh, which they can choose to accept. Um, so, we're, um, we're doing it together instead of holding separate elections for national committee delegates and national committee alternates. Um, so are there any questions about that before we proceed with the self nominations? And just to save us a few minutes because we're coming up on what is supposed to be our lunch break. Um, I believe that we already have a number of of nominations for NC delegate, uh, including myself, Mike McAllister, Sam Chance, Melissa Minkoff, and Joe Nathan ZB Kingfisher. Is that accurate? Uh, that's that's accurate. That's who we have for flux on the ballot right now. Okay. Are there any other self nominations for national committee? Uh, yeah, can we go over, Mike. repeat the self nominations? Uh, yes. So Dave Schwab, Mike McAllister, Sam Chance, Melissa Minkoff, and Joe Nathan, ZB Kingfisher. And and I <laughs> earlier I, I self-nominated for at large and also um, CD4 for, well, but no, I'm talking about the coordinating council. We're talking about office. Yeah. Well, so just now we're talking about national committee and coordinating council is the, is the very next thing that we'll get to. Oh. Um, yeah, so for coordinating council, we have uh, representatives in congressional districts one through eight, and up to eight at large coordinating council representatives. Um, so I see we have we have some in the chat and some that you know have 
previously been expressed. I see Bruce Hinkforth, self-nominating for at-large, CC rep, Tom Rodman for District 4, and also for at-large, uh, Joe Nathan, Kingfisher for um, District uh, District. Are you in seven or eight? Seven. Seven. Okay. Um, and let's see, looking at, uh, previously self-nominated, um, let's see. Um, did Mike McAllister, did you also, Mike and Melissa? Yes, I previously nominated for uh, District 2. And, and I will nominate for both District 4 and at large. I'll nominate for at large as well, I suppose. Okay. We have any other self nominations for coordinating council? All right. So I think um, we are done with the uh, with the self nominations portion. So basically our ballots are set and, you know, just wanted to put a question out for a, uh, a temperature check. Right now it's 12.04 PM. Um, we had scheduled a lunch break at 12 and to resume at one to continue any unfinished business. Um, so do, would people prefer to, um, you know, have candidate speeches, uh, question, answer, discussion now, um, and, you know, then take the lunch break or would, or would folks prefer to take the lunch break now and then, um, you know, come back and do the, uh, candidate speeches, question, and answer, discussion, et cetera. Oh, excuse me. Anyone feel free to get on stack if you have a preference. Stack, Kingfisher. Go ahead. I'd prefer to keep talking if um, people are up for it, though. Um, yeah, I understand that uh, people want to eat sometimes. Uh, I, I, I Just a preference. I'd prefer to keep talking past. Uh, we want to eat, but we can postpone uh, past. <laughs> Okay. Eat, eat, please wow. eat. <laughs> well, is there, so is there anyone with a, anyone else with a preference for continuing with the agenda versus lunch break now? Bill, go ahead. I would say continue. Um, remind me what items do we have left on, um, business uh so so basically the only item left is um if any um if any candidates for positions want to make short speeches um and then we can have a period of questions for candidates uh, as well as discussion regarding candidates and you know, we already, you know, basically had discussion around the uh, the platform and bylaws. So, yeah, we can just stick to officer elections. Um, okay. So, Thanks, go ahead. Um, 
As a train facilitator, breaks are important. Uh, when you skip breaks, um, it, it tends to slow down the meeting. I mean, people take a break they need. Uh, they have time to you know do whatever they need to do. But it actually it's tends to shorten meetings or at least shorten the agenda if people have a time to take a break. You know, breaks are important. They shouldn't be skipped. So I would suggest at least a half hour break. Yes. King Fitcher yeah. back. Yeah, to just to clarify real quick, um, we're not talking about skipping the break, but the the question is do we want to take it now or a little bit later? Like do we want to stop where we are, take the break now, or do we want to finish the current item and then take the break? So that, um, hopefully that clarifies. I don't know, I think, um, I don't see the speeches being that short or at least, I think we should just take a break, you know. Um, it's been two hours, that's about, um, that's pretty much the uh, limit for most, most people in a meeting, you should take a break at least every two hours. Sam okay. Stack. Um, I think they should stack. I'm on the deck. Jonathan. Oh. And, um, and then Sam. And I see uh, Greg sent a message saying after lunch. So that's another vote for uh, taking a break now. Uh, Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, I'm here in Elders. Want to take a break? I'd like to take a break. Uh, withdraw my uh, preference for continuing past. Uh, Sam, go ahead. I mean, if if the uh, if the consensus is going towards taking a break, then um, I'm not going to hold that up. Uh, my personal preference would be towards um, doing the speeches uh, because we're kind of breaking the. Um, that agenda item in half otherwise. Um, so flow wise, you know, I think that that would be the way to go. Um, however, uh, you know, if, if, if the majority is that we should uh, take a break, then I um, don't care too much, pass. Okay, yeah. Well, hearing, you know, some people have a, fairly strong preference for taking a break, then um, yeah, I'm certainly amenable to that. So, uh, okay, so right now it is 1210. So why don't we, you know, just take our break and resume our meeting at one. Um, does that work for everyone? Any, uh, any unresolved concerns? Okay. Um, great. So we'll we'll take a break now and reconvene at one. Uh, yeah, and you know we're making good time, so oh, it's all good. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, talk to you soon. Enjoy your lunch, hey, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome back. Hope you had an enjoyable lunch. We just had someone uh, come in and the display name is 835255. That's Jeff Reese. What's that? That's Jeff Reese. Oh, Jeff Reese. Okay. Uh, I don't know why. Yeah, Jeff, are you able to change your name just so that we can? Oh, great. Thank you. All right. All right. So where we left off was we had just finished the um, self-nomination process for officer elections. And, you know, so now there is an opportunity for candidates to give a short speech. Um, you know, let's try to keep them to you know, three minutes or less. Um, and you don't have to, um, you know, give a speech if you don't want to, but, um, and, you know, then 
let's also uh, have some space for people to ask questions. Um, so why don't we just do it position by position and then, you know, we will, we'll have space to ask questions, you know, if, if anyone wants to have any discussion or comments, but, you know, let's try to keep it brief. Um, and yeah, so let's start with, uh, you know, let's go in the same order that we did before. So let's start with the co-chair election. So Sam Chance is our only candidate. Sam, would you like to say something? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not really too great at speeches, but um, basically since I joined the party, um, what my habit has been is to go where the work is. Go where um, I think that I can do good in the party um, and focus there. Uh, when Joe Nathan... Um, nominated me and asked me to run for uh for this position um i had to take some time to consider it because it's 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 a big uh task and especially with the um how the years line up um it's it's gonna mean you know heading into and through the uh, 2024 election which as wisconsin greens know is uh it's kind of a rough time to um, be a public facing green. Um, so, but I'm happy to to um, to volunteer to serve uh, if if the members of the state um, party will have me. Um, I like to just uh, discuss a few um, things uh, in. Uh, I should probably turn my camera on. Um, as far as uh, what I will try to focus on um, or some ideas um, for how to move forward. Um, I think that we need to really embrace planning, um, looking ahead, having plans, um, you know, for the next three months, for the next six months, a year, 18 months, two years. Um, know where we need to focus during those periods um, so that we can move ahead and achieve our goals, um, grow the party and grow our influence um, and our ability to uh, elect candidates and also to um, do good in our communities and in our state. Um, there's a lot of things that I see where it's, it's like we, um, we could have seen this coming. There's holidays, there's, um, you know, foreseeable events. And um, often, you know, we are reacting um, not long before they happen or, or after they occur. Um, it's, it's a source of, um, of burnout. And, um, you know, I think that if we want to... Uh, be able to bring in and hold on to really hardworking um, volunteers, it's important that we um, plan ahead. Um, I, I also think that at this point, it's, it's vital that we grow our membership. Um, as Bill mentioned, uh, that's where our income is from. We're a dues-based party. Uh, we need to have um, we need to have members. Uh, if we don't have members, then we we can't exist. Um, and so, I mean, I think you know we need to really uh, reboot the membership outreach committee. Um, for a while, that has not really been getting the attention that um, it needs, and that's because so many areas need attention um but it is really important and um you know i think that that we see that in in declining membership numbers over the the past year or two um so i mean i think that we need to be focused on multiple areas there um we need to grow our existing local chapters 
which, um, you know, Madison and Milwaukee are kind of currently our power bases where we we have some more members. Um, but we also need to um, expand out. We need to recruit folks that are in districts that don't have any representation on the coordinating council. Um, and we need to give them the resources to uh, to create local chapters in those areas. Um, and that's going to take some creativity. That's going to take some doing. Um, it's it's not an easy task, but I it's 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 essential. We should be a statewide party um, and have representation statewide. I also think it's important um, that we that we have a focus on our campuses. Um, we should be trying to um, recruit students, young people, high school age, college age, and also give them the resources to establish um, youth chapters in those areas. Um, you know, we, we young people are very radical uh, uh, demographically, and that's a group that we really need to, um, to tap into. Uh, there's a lot of energy there, and there has been a lot of, um, I think, desire expressed um, over the past few years to to see uh, change that the Democrats aren't going to deliver, and we need to be able to step in and and be able to deliver um, on those things. Um, frankly, if we don't, um, somebody else is going to um, is going to outflank us on the left or or whatever you want to call it, um, and then you know we know it happens. Done. Um, caucuses uh we have four caucuses currently those need to be reinvigorated um another um thing which i think needs to occur is that we need to have um more frequent membership meetings um quarterly monthly um this will benefit us in a number of ways uh it will increase our capacity to do business Currently, um, if we want to amend our bylaws or amend our platform, um, we're limited to a bi-yearly schedule with two meetings. Um, and um, it will also benefit us in that it will take less pressure, it will take pressure off of the biannual gatherings, which will allow us to focus on guest speakers and panels, which we can use to bring in new individuals who might otherwise not be trying to come to a green party gathering and then we can use that to recruit them into the party um and also it it will be good in terms of creating um materials for for our uh, media um uh, and um besides that um I think that um, members of the current coordinating council can tell you that um, I like expanding out procedures, formalizing things, knowing how we should operate, um, removes ambiguity and allows us to move forward um, in a more um, expeditious way um, and appropriate way. Uh, I've, I've created um, from procedures uh, for the National Committee of Delegates. Um, I'm going to work on um, procedures uh, for the uh, internal elections um, so that we can have that formalized and ran in our bylaws. In the past, I've talked about formalizing further dispute resolution process, um, which currently uh, is, is not properly developed. Um, I'll just end um, with two things uh, in terms of where we should focus um, issues wise. Uh, we should, in my opinion, we should be focusing on the local and state levels. Um, obviously there's important things happening on the national level. There's important things happening um, internationally, globally, uh, but we're the green party that um, is is responsible for for addressing these issues and that's that's how we're going to grow um our membership in the party is by 
focusing on the things which which impact people and which we can only um, that we can only really be the ones in terms of the Green Party to be focusing on. Um, and uh, we should also be trying to focus on issues where we have agreement, um, issues which are not divisive. I um, over the time that I've been in the party, I've seen um, divisive issues come in, and I've seen them um, create situations that have made folks not want to participate. Um, we all feel uh, very passionately about things. Um, and it would be good if we can use that passion um, for for the benefit of the party by um, using it to engage with the things that we can agree on um, and not use that passion in a way where it's going to have us um, at each other's throats or feeling some kind of um, antagonisms towards each other or like this person is preventing me from pursuing my interests. Um, there are, th you know, we, we can focus on those things elsewhere outside the party in a way where it's not going to, to really, um, you know, kind of put us at each other's throats. Uh, so I hope that um, folks will give me a chance to, to act, to um, coordinate the activities of the coordinating council and, um, to act as co-chair, uh, it's a responsibility um, that I will take uh, very seriously. Um, I I put a lot of time into the party. I'm going to continue to put a lot of time into the party. Um, I guess that's what I'll leave it uh, at. Pass. Thanks, Sam. Um, does anyone have any questions for Sam? Yeah, I do. Go ahead. Um, mm -hmm. The largest single voting block has always been the independents. So you sound like you think we're in a appendage of the Democratic Party or that's where our potential recruits are coming from. All I can say is the independents are the largest group. And how do we appeal to people in that category who don't identify with any particular party? How do we address their issues? Yes. Certainly. Thanks for that question, Bruce. So one thing I would say um, that sets us apart from um, both the Democrats and the Republicans uh, is that we are not a capitalist party. <laughs> we're, we're, we're not a party who is beholden to money. We, we don't seek out um, our, our funding from corporations. We, we oppose the bipartisan um, consensus on war. We, we oppose the bipartisan consensus on um, essentially creating the, uh, the property relations that, that allow for, uh, for the Democrats and Republicans to exist. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I agree with you, Bruce. We, we need to go after the independents. And I think that a big part of the independents are, are, are folks that have seen uh, the game that uh, the duopoly is engaging in. They, they see why they're engaging in it, the, the, the um, interests uh, which are behind it. Um, and we need to be right there um, appealing to them and differentiating ourselves from the Democrats. I don't think that um, a majority of our recruits are, are coming from the Democrats. I, I think that's a mischaracterization. I, I think that um, a lot of folks, um, and uh, as far as the, the Democratic uh, Party are, are concerned, um, I mean, they might come over um, if, if we uh, start winning elections or having a, a, a bigger presence in their community. Um, but no, that's, that's not where we grow initially, uh, pass. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. 
Um, so just keeping in mind that the history of the Green Party has very much been an on the ground movement in the community. Um, and that's, that's where we have thrived in the past. And, and that's probably where we will continue to thrive as much as we do that. Um, so my question is, Sam, how will you as spokesperson um, help fulfill that role of um, being one of the faces of our party uh, on the ground uh, in the public space and in, in the community? Certainly. Um, thank you for that question, Barb. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable. Um, Engaging with the media, I'm comfortable engaging uh, with members of my community. Um, I I'm present and active in my um, in my neighborhood. Uh, I am present and active with um, the uh, local leadership here. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, um, the four leg screens are are involved in. Um, in a process of recruiting local candidates. Uh, so, I mean, I, I mean, I'll, I go uh, where the folks are. Um, I think maybe what you're alluding to is that um, I'm not currently comfortable with the uh, level of safety protocols that exists in public. Um, and um, that's true. Um, I, I wear an N95 mask when I'm in public spaces. Um, I don't think that that prevents me from um, connecting with my community or being an on the ground um, face uh, of the party. Um, I think that what that does is it demonstrates that um, I'm sensitive to the interests of, of folks that um, are also uh, threatened in those situations. Um, you know, I, I stand in solidarity with them. Um, and, you know, um, a, a two-way masking policy is more effective than a one-way masking policy, which is essentially what the um, Biden administration, the Democrats um, have, have pushed uh, rather successfully in the media. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think that... Um, we're recovered yet to the point where I'm I'm going to be going around um, unmasked, and I think that that that's my choice. Uh, pass. Thanks, Sam. Are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, not hearing any. So we'll now create space for discussion, but I do want to remind people to be conscious of time. Um, you know, we're supposed to get to the next uh, segment at two. And um, yeah, we are technically behind in our uh, schedule right now. So uh, are there any uh, brief comments? Uh, Tom Stanton. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's a d very divisive issue, but I, I spend so much time on it, the health freedom issue. I just want to weigh in there and just say masks are not effective. Yeah, it's a personal choice. It's also a personal statement. It uh, prevents me from seeing your face, prevents me from s seeing your smile, prevents me from hearing you often. And um, they're not needed. I'm not gonna, it's no way to live a life if you're wearing a mask, especially when it's not needed. Um, so this, this health freedom issue, you know, I'd like to see someone who would show some solidarity supporting people that don't want, that uh, don't want to be jabbed in order to hold on to their jobs. So I'm very strongly against the mandates and would hope that the co-chair would be uh, in support of, of informed consent and uh, not tying vaccines to uh, to a job 
or to the attendance at school for, uh, for children. I'm very concerned about mandating uh, <clears throat> getting the vaccines into the uh, child vaccination program. Uh, pass. Okay, so I put myself on stack and we also have Melissa and Bill. Um, I just want to really strongly wholeheartedly support what Sam said about, you know, on the many issues where we have consensus, focusing our energy and engaging on those issues. And, um, you know, uh, I, I would go further in than what he said and say that the continual dragging us back into issues where folks disagree with the group consensus and are unwilling to accept the group consensus um, have been a tremendous drain on our time and our energy and have repelled who knows how many people from the party. And we need to stop that and we need to focus on the positive, you know, the many positive consensus issues in our platform that we all agree on. Uh, so I support what Sam said, 100% pass. Uh, Melissa and Bill are on stack. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, one thing I'll say is that I, I mean, I absolutely agree with you and Sam in regards to your comments on, on uh, focusing on things which we agree upon rather than continuing to rehash divisive issues over and over. Um, so I won't belabor the point, but I absolutely agree with both of you. And I will, I just wanted to say that like Sam works very hard for the party. He's very dedicated. Um, just, I guess I'm just uh, speaking up in support of, of Sam. I think he would make a fantastic co-chair. Um, like I said, he's very dedicated. He is active on several com committees. He is active uh, locally, and he's active in the community of Madison. And um, so, and I think that he has several good ideas, and I just um, very much support uh, his endeavor to be co chair. Pass. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, Bill is on stack. When I heard that Sam was interested in the um, co chair position, I was as thrilled as when I learned that Barbara Dahlgren was interested in the uh, co-chair position a number of years ago. Both of uh, those individuals share something in common, that is youthful drive, energy, determination, and uh, a full commitment to the, um, to, the, to the organization on every level. So I am very pleased that Sam uh, has stepped forward. Um, I just wanted to make uh, an additional comment on the um, treasurer position. I just uh, following up on what I had said earlier for, per, for people's um, information, we have an operations tr treasurer um, post and a campaign treasurer's post. At our relatively modest level of statewide activity today, the operations um, treasurer position is a pretty easy job. It involves uh, monitoring our accounts, uh, minor administrative activity, a lot of reporting to the organization, and also just uh, advising, alerting, and, make, and recommending on, on financial matters. Um, the campaign treasurer position is um, a far more challenging position. If you talk to Patty Ashby, our, our um, bookkeeper, she's got it down. So it may not seem like such a big deal to her. But for someone like me, um, almost everybody in this room has better and more advanced uh, computer skills than I do. And one of the most important aspects of the job is being uh, comfortable with and knowing how to work with Nation Builder and um, um, online uh, reporting. 
I, and I'm not good at that. So um, when we uh, do get to the point where we are able to fill that campaign treasurer position, um, whether it be um, from among folks in this room or others that we are able to recruit, um, we need to spend some time uh, training that person, and it needs to be a person who is um, who has good computer skills. So I'll pass on that. Thanks, Bill. Okay, um, so we um, we were still technically we had not finished the discussion on the co-chair election, but. You know, I'll, I'll take that bill as your kind of intro, um, you know, to the to the treasurer discussion. Um, is there anyone who hasn't spoken regarding the co-chair election who, you know, would like to make a brief comment? Uh, Kingfisher sec. Go ahead. That? Yes. Oh, I, I just wanted to speak up, and and Sam, I really appreciate your your vast technical capacity and your dedication to difficult hard work, and that combination can take a person and a organization and a political party sky high. I really appreciate what you've done. You've done a tremendous amount already. And uh, everybody that uh, IT uh, based has done a tremendous amount and it, it's been a challenge to work together. You've done tremendously well to work together and I commend you all, especially you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you very much for stepping forward and please everybody respect this man's technical capacity and his, his hard work that, that he has already demonstrated. And thank you, uh, pass. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay. Um, is there anyone else who uh, who hasn't spoken yet on the, the co-chair election who'd like to make a brief comment? Uh, yeah, let's move on. So, um, okay, so Bill had, uh, you know, brought up, um, you know, just his, perspective on the treasurer election. Are there any questions for Bill? Not hearing any. Any discussion about the treasurer election? Not hearing any. Okay. All right. So next up is recording secretary. We have Barbara Dahlgren has self nominated. Barbara, do you want to um, do you want to give a speech? Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, I'll say a few words. So I'm, this is, um, I'm coming off my first term as recording secretary. Um, officially, I was doing some recording secretary work before I was recording secretary this last year. And I decided that um, it would probably be good for me to have another term. I come to all of the meetings and um, take minutes. So those are available for everybody. Um, so, I mean, that's, I, I've already shown that I can do the job. The other thing that I was doing um, as recording secretary this last year that I, um, it was a project that I embarked on um, was that I got all of these file boxes um, from older members of the party who um, one of them just like fell in my lap from somebody I went to, a, I was door knocking and some old party records fell into my lap and others are from Dots and Zeps who was um, a co-chair and you know, somebody who is really, um, so what I was saying was that I had all of these file boxes that are 
um, you know, just in, in my care right now that nobody can really see these old records. And it's really fantastic. I've been, I have been going through them uh, in my spare time throughout the year, and I'm almost through one of them. <laughs> I've been taking pictures of every document and digitizing them. They're not for um, membership consumption quite yet because they're not up on our drive. Um, but they are being digitized little by little. And there are old Green Party newsletters, old minutes from the last few decades that um, Greens have been working together on this stuff. So I figure having another term, maybe, just maybe, we can get through all these file boxes and really have a good understanding of um, the Green Party throughout this entire time that the Wisconsin Greens have been working Obviously, some of us here have a very good memory of that. I know that Bruce has been here since the very beginning. <laughs> um, but to make that knowledge more um, accessible to the full membership, even if you've just come in, because I think that it's really great to know where what our roots were and what people have discussed throughout the years, what our difficulties have been. And um, just to really have a lot of more transparency as an organization in general. So um, that's that's pretty much my goal. If uh, I get elected, even if I don't get elected, maybe there's a way I can help out with that. But um, thanks for your time, and I'll take any questions. All right. Thanks, Barb. Are there any questions for Barb? Any discussion? Okay, great. Uh, can I just um, stack? Go ahead. So we have somebody in the waiting room with the name Cheryl McFarlane. Um, I do not think that this is Cheryl uh, for obvious reasons. Um, what yeah. do folks think? Yeah, um, you know, she said that she couldn't make it, so. Okay, so I'm not going to allow them in. Thank you. Sam, is there any way to dialogue with the person in the waiting room? Can you do that? I don't know. Might challenge them and see if um, you can, they might be able to approve or disprove. There is um, what I mean. What challenge would you recommend? Our challenge. What what color is your kitchen stove or something? Yeah. Why? Well, I, I could text to Oh. Yeah, how about somebody tries to get in contact with her independently, and then if if she's actually trying to get in, then we'll admit her. Oh, it looks like she, they're not trying to get in any longer. Oh. Sorry, I'm just trying not to have another uh, Zoom bombing incident. Yeah, yeah. No, well, well done. Um, you know, we outsmarted them. Uh, they probably just opened the website and put in the first name they saw. So, um, all right. So, um, next up is national committee. Um, so we have uh, five people who have you know declared intention to run for national committee. Um, yeah, so let's, um, you know, so that's me, Mike, Sam, Melissa, and Joe Nathan. Um, would anyone like to start and let's try to, let's try to keep the, uh, intro speeches relatively brief, just trying to be mindful of time. Excuse me. Um, so would anyone like to start? Uh, I can start if um, nobody else wants to. Sure, go right ahead. 
Sure. Uh, so I've served um, as alternate on the uh, national committee for the past year. Um, during that time, um, I've contributed to several discussion threads. Um, it seems that folks on the national committee think that um, the way I conduct myself is um, appropriate um, and um, uh, I'm good. Uh, I'm, I'm string of words. Um, I was elected forum manager, which is essentially a moderator position for the national committee. This demonstrates um, a significant trust. Um, I've also um, formalized some of our reporting procedures uh, for reporting proposals um, before the national committee to the um, to the Corning Council, um, and I plan to um, expand that to uh, also um, be informing the, the general membership as well. Pass. Thanks, Sam. I can, go. Go I can go. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Okay, so uh, last year when I when I ran for for national committee, uh, I said that I wanted to be on the NC because I believe the Green Party can grow and meet the massive challenges facing us by fo focusing its energies on participating in the most important social movements for people and planet. I still want to do that. Uh, we need to elect more candidates who stand on these values, principles, and strategies. I think we can do this if we stay focused. And I've tried uh, to 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 a limited uh, extent uh, to try and foster uh, better relations among NC members. Uh, I've learned a lot in the last year and hope to continue. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, would anyone like to go next? I'll go. Um, I'll, I just will quickly, briefly say that I have been uh, serving as a national alternate for the past year as well. And um, it's it's been a very educational experience and a learning experience for me and uh, one that I hope to continue pass. Thanks, Melissa. Okay. Uh, Kingfisher, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, is this for the delegate stuff? I, I have right, to apologize. Yeah. I just had a, a, a old acquaintance who's now homeless in the winter stopped by the house looking for a place to live for a few weeks. So I had to go over some, some uh, extraordinary domestic issue, details and yeah. such. I, I don't know what's going on. Are we doing delegate talks? Yeah, this, delegate? yeah, yeah. we're talking National Committee delegates now. So if, if you'd like to give just like a brief speech about, you know, why you would like to be chosen as a delegate.
can feel Thanks, everybody. Have uh, <laughs> have a great vote. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. So then the other candidate is me. So um, you know, I've been serving as a national committee delegate for the last year, and um, you know, I, I think it's been an important year for the Green Party. Uh, you know, as I mentioned before, we've made a lot of uh, progress on our platform and, um, you know, some, some big decisions about, you know, how to respond to the uh, political situation that we're in. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, my years of experience with the Green Party and working on Jill Stein's campaign, working on the Lisa Savage campaign, Matt Ho, um, Howie Hawkins, is, you know, as well as others and local campaigns, you know, have given me, uh, you know, perspective about, you know, what we need to do in order to, you know, be successful and grow, uh, reach more people, uh, you know, and deal with all the challenges that we face. Um, you know, I think I've also gotten a good view at, you know, the national party and, um, the potential that it has, as well as some of the challenges, some of the structural issues. Um, you know, I'm very uh, interested and willing to engage with that. You know, I, on the national level, I'm a member of the media committee, platform committee, as well as um, co chair of the Green Pages um, committee, which is the official publication of Green Party US. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I have working relationships with a lot of people um, around the country, both on the national committee and just in various state parties. Um, you know, I'm an active green on social media and, uh, you know, just have encountered a lot of people over the years working on various campaigns, national meetings. Um, so I've, you know, good working relationships with folks and, um, you know, even though the national committee email listserv can be challenging at times and, you know, there can be a lot of kind of distracting and sometimes negative uh, noise, um, you know, I always strive to kind of try to find consensus with people, try to find common ground, um, try to, you know, steer conversations in the right direction and you know figure out ways that we can improve things and uh you know deal with with some of the issues that we're facing so anyway um yeah so i would i would be very happy to uh, you know have another term as a national committee delegate um so do we have any um 
Any questions? Okay, not, not seeing any questions. Do we have any discussion? Um, so Sam is doing moderation now. I think for the benefit of people that have not been delegates, it, I mean, I'm just interested if Sam could comment because about how the NC delegates um, you know, make decisions and how the moderation's done, what he's learned. He's been doing that for, I don't know, a couple of weeks or longer. I, I respect that work. It's got to be difficult. But, I, you know, I'm just, it's not a high priority thing, but I'm just thinking it might help people understand how how, um, how things operate uh, past. Uh, so are you asking for... Um for information. information sorry go on well, yeah. so it's lower priority it's not like i'm challenging individual candidates you know as. sure um but um I, sorry um but, but are you are you uh seeing information on how the national committee makes decisions or how um how forum management um decisions are made on the national committee well, I think it's all kind of interrelated. Maybe a few things you've learned that you didn't know. And, you know, like Melissa said that uh, it's been a learning process. I guess, I don't know, most of us are seasoned, but on the other hand, there's a recording of this. So people that don't know that much about the Green Party, you could give them kind of an overview of just how it operates and how you, how you moderate the discussion on the listserv and you know, why aren't they doing, for example, I think they should be doing a lot more Zoom meetings and possibly more in-person meetings, but that's not practical for a nationwide thing. But why aren't they doing more Zoom meetings? Because I think that listserv can be so divisive um, task. Um, yeah, I can, I can say just a few things. Um, Decisions uh, on the National Committee are made um, state party caucus um, or another entity um, brings forward a proposal. Um, it goes through the steering committee, which is the governing um, committee for the National Committee. Um, they basically do a review of it to make sure that it, um, it is appropriate um, in terms of formatting, um, clarification of terms, those kinds of things for um, discussion and vote uh, by the National Committee. Um, if it's not, they provide findings and then the state party or caucus would um, basically implement those. Um, there's an appeals process if uh, members of the National Committee don't feel that uh, that's appropriate. Um, it's, uh, it's got a five um, state party or caucus um, threshold. Um, so that's, um, that's decision making in that way, uh, as far as deliberation goes, um, and why it might not be occurring in, uh, Zoom meetings or potentially in person, um, it's, it's probably because of the, um, geographic, uh, dispersed, you know, people are in different locations, people, uh, have busy lives, there's, um, there's over a hundred uh, delegates and alternates on the national committee. Um, so from a practical standpoint, um, trying to achieve those things through a Zoom meeting uh, might not be viable. Committees, uh, including the steering committee, utilize um, online meetings. Um, I believe many caucuses uh, do as well. Um, as far as moderation decisions go, um, it's a 
Right now it's a four person team. It's typically going to be a five person team based on new four major protocols, which were um, passed a uh, month or two ago. Um, there's there's thresholds for different kinds of actions to occur. So basically, so something like a warning, um, warnings which can accrue multiple warnings into a moderation of a delegate or an um, alternate, um, requires two uh, form managers. Um, one form manager can object, and then three are required to override. Uh, then um, for moderation, three four managers are required. Um, after that, uh, there is a recommendation of the state party or caucus to remove that delegate um, from the national committee, um, with the idea being that they'll elect another one. Um, and uh, there's also an appeals process for all of those things. Uh, I'm just trying to make sure I'm not leaving anything out, um, but I feel like I've given a fairly detailed uh, account so far. Uh, pass. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, thanks for taking on that work. It's, it's a big job. Um, all right. So are there any other uh, questions regarding the National Committee delegates? Excuse me. Or any other discussion regarding the National Committee delegate election? All right, not hearing any. So let's keep it moving and go to uh, coordinating council representatives. Um, so could we just have a recap of who has thrown their hat in the ring? Um, actually, I'll go down the participant list. I believe it's Melissa, Tom, Mike, Bruce, Joe Nathan. Is that accurate, or you know, is there anyone else? Uh, what's this for a national delegate? No, this is for uh, the state coordinating council. Okay. All right. Yeah. You had you had expressed before that you were interested in self nominating for your district. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, uh, farm life in Northwoods winter is constant animal rescue. Uh, I, I'm actually saving animal lives, so I had to, I, for for the sake of uh, humanity and nature, I had to step away. So yeah, uh, I I'm, I'm in for District Seven Athens. Past. Okay. Thanks. So, um, why don't we start with Melissa? Sure, I'll just be pretty brief. Um, so I have been serving on the, the coordinating council for the past year. Um, and in, in addition to that, I'm active on several committees. I'm the co-chair of the IT committee along with Sam. Um, I'm on the platform and policy committee. I'm on the communications committee. Um, and so um, I've I've learned a lot in this first year, again, and uh, in my experience serving on the coordinating council, and I hope to continue. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Um, next, let's go to Tom. All right, I'll try to time this. Um, so, you know, I've been on the coordinating council for a couple of years or maybe more. Um, so I'm retired, so I've got time. Uh, I, I look though, I, I'm probably spending about 25 hours on non-Green Party stuff on the health freedom uh, area. So I don't have as much time. Um, 
but um, I had been, uh, you know, involved in the outreach and membership committee, and I'm still willing to do that. But we need a, a leader for that. Involved in the IT committee uh, platform and policy and communications uh, and elections. Um, let's see. Um, in the platform and policy, I'm really interested in, in the Ukraine situation, in the health freedom and finance banking, uh, public banking, uh, modern monetary theory, you know, like how we can afford some of the stuff that's done at the national level uh, in the Green Party. It's really interesting, Howard Schweitzer's work. Um, in IT, I think Sam and Melissa are, are doing a good job and I um, want to continue to support that. And I think there's information I can, I can continue to transfer to them um, and continue to work with them. Um, social media, um, the committee, I'm trying to you know help out with the social media campaigns. I'm getting better at doing it. I reached about uh, 1,200 people in the last couple of days on a particular social media post. So I'm learning more about social media. Um, and then, you know, I want to support the idea of, Sam brought up the idea of more membership meetings. I also am exploring the idea of um, direct democracy, like Switzerland, um, you know, we're more of a representative, but I'd like to explore that idea. And I certainly like that, to continue to support OPA vote, proportional um, ranked choice voting. Uh, so uh, that's that's basically it. Um, uh, and I'm under three minutes, so uh, pass. Thanks, Tom. So next, uh, let's hear from Mike. And always better to unmute first. <laughs> I'll try to be brief. Uh, first, a, a technical question. For the last year, I have been representing the uh, uh, 5th Congressional District uh, on the State Coordinating Council. Uh, in, in their infinite wisdom, the State Supreme Court moved me into the 4th District uh, for, this, uh, for the next 10 years, uh, which is why I'm seeking that seat uh, at, at this time. Uh, I currently, in addition to serving on the coordinating council, I've been working on the communications committee and uh, I drop in and out of elections. Uh, so uh, I want to continue the work. I think uh, uh, both as a a uh, long time member, I, I provide some institutional memory and it, but uh, mostly I'm interested in, in moving things forward and uh, want to continue in that role on the State Coordinating Council. Pass. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, next let's hear from Bruce. Uh, so I, do I understand that uh, there is no candidate for the actual fifth district since Mike is now in the fourth district? Oh, so, yes, that's correct. I think that's yeah. well, then I'd like to volunteer to be in the fifth district rep because. I live in the 5th District. Okay, I've taken a year off. Um, joined the gym. Got slimmer. Got my blood pressure down. Cut my ponytail off. But from the looks of the size of the meeting, we still need a lot of help. Oh, I thought we... I mean, we've had larger meetings here. Right after election. It's kind of... It's kind of a surprise. But anyway... So I've been a member of this party for 35 years and uh, 
I'd like to continue to contribute. So I talked to Barb a little bit about some election things. And I think I'd like to be help her on the election committee. And uh, just contribute my, my history and my experience. We really try to grow this part. Yes. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, so next up is Joe Nathan. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Well, at some point, uh, outgoing administration, you know, some administration uh, brags about what they've done, and uh, <laughs> humility is one of the virtues. <laughs> so, um, well, no, I mean, I, I feel like we have something to celebrate this year. You know, collectively, we wanted to get ballot line access back. We got we got that. So that, that was a big success. And, um, membership is, uh, a consensus, uh, issue to address. And, uh, I, I really, um, appreciate the diversity and, uh, getting along past our differences and, uh, being the good greens that we all are. And so, um, right. I, I appreciate, um, uh, time served and look forward to, uh, uh, collective uh, contribution uh, with all our talents, our many, many talents. And uh, I'm appreciative of everyone. And um, right, the Greens are, we're a special group. Um, we're, we're every bit uh, ugly American, yet we are trying our best to be the best morally and um, right for, for each other, for humanity, for the planet and um, I, I'm, I'm happy to be, to have been and aspire to continue to be part of all that. So thank you, everyone. Um, it, it has been a pleasure. And um, right, it, it's great that, that we are green and we are good together green. So uh, uh, we're, we're sitting great for, for some real accomplishments. Let's put it, to, to get, put it together and be together and uh, yeah, go green, go green. Pass, pass. All right, thanks, Joe Nathan. Um, does anyone have any questions for the uh, coordinating council candidates? Uh, Sam Stack. Go ahead. Um, I have a question for uh, for Bruce. Um, so. For the past year and during the um, the election, um, I mean, basically after the last fall gathering, you uh, you criticized the um, the gathering, and then you just took off, and if nobody could get in contact with you the past year, as far as I can tell, um, <laughs> and uh, no assistance during the election. Um, I mean, how uh, how can we be confident that um, if you get frustrated again, you're not just going to uh, take off, pass? Well, it looks like uh, there's a general mood here that we need to get past our differences and focus on the things that we have consensus on basically and work together. That was not the case last fall. Things were very, very divided. This party as much as a deepening division nationwide. I mean, it's just a lot of divisiveness. Um, I needed to take a break, and I took a break. Like I said, I joined the gym, lost some weight, got my blood pressure down, which keeps my, uh, my 
phone is getting frustrated down. But anyway, I'm back. Um, I never left the party. I paid my memberships. So just willing to contribute again. I hope that's uh, good enough for everybody. Uh, King Fisher Stack. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, I just wanted to appreciate uh, what Bruce is saying. And, uh, you know, on a personal level, I, I have had to make life choices to be a bit healthier. And, uh, you know, for instance, I, I need a good night's sleep. I was burning camel at both ends too long for a long time. And I made a life choice. And, you know, here's a, a good reset time and yeah so um things are different now and uh different challenges and different opportunities and we've got really really a lot of great opportunities in the next uh you know couple years and we we have got to make good on these opportunities because uh yeah the world and our future is important uh future generations are important so right um appreciate everybody past Okay. Yeah. I, I'd like to put myself on stack, you know, just to kind of follow up on this conversation. And, you know, I, I basically want to put it out to all the CC candidates, um, you know, because we have been talking about the need to grow our membership, to get more people engaged, um, you know, to get more members, more people active on our committees, more candidates, more local chapters, um, you know, and, and we've seen some, you know, divisive issues come up where there was disagreement and, you know, even after decisions were made, there was still, you know, continuing fighting about it. And, you know, we've seen our, our membership dwindle in, in that same time and, and we've seen active members fall away and we've seen new people not come back after being at meetings like that. So, you know, I, I just want to, you know, hear that people are committed to, you know, working on things that we have consensus on, um, growing our membership and, you know, doing the, the practical hard work of party building as opposed to relitigating um, old issues that have been settled and, you know, trying to, you know, to get the upper hand on, you know, some, some issues, you know, and, and in, in the same way that has been so damaging to the party. So um, yes, it's an editorial question. <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to hear how uh, coordinating council candidates feel about that. I can put myself on stack to answer, Dave, if you'd like. Yeah, please go ahead. Um. Yeah, I'll be brief. I absolutely agree with the, uh, I mean, I've expressed it earlier in this meeting that I absolutely agree with the sentiment that we need to uh, rally around causes with which we agree and um, focus on those areas of agreement rather than these divisive topics that, um, you know, they're, they're, they're settled, but yet then they continue to come up. They continue to monopolize group time. They continue to reinforce these deep divisions and they're ultimately quite destructive. And so um, I personally am committed to finding areas of focus. There's, there's several points which we agree upon um, rallying around those key pillars and values and offering an alternative to people who are tired of the two-party duopoly that um, is dominating our political sphere and um, dominating our way of, of life. So uh, I personally um, am interested on focusing on these issues, both like uh, 
state and local, as well as national and international, but focusing on those points of agreement, because there certainly are many of those paths. Thank you. Would other CC candidates also speak to the topic? Um, yeah, like I, I mentioned earlier, I think we need to focus not only on those things that we have consensus on, but also on things that um, the voters are focused on and uh, really hammer home it on, on our vision for what to do. Um, and be pragmatic and not idealistic, ideological, okay? Um, the, the things that people care about are obvious. I mean, there are multiple um, constant polls that show which things really concern people. And uh, like the economy is a big one. I mean, this country is about to take a big hit because we're no longer going to be the world's hegemon, okay? That's ending. Multipolar world is in process of forming. So our domination, 500 years of colonialism is over, okay? It's over. And we got to learn to work with other people. And we got to learn to focus on what people in this country are really concerned about and really need. And that's how we're going to grow. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Uh, I see Mike's on stack. Uh, we used to call ourselves uh, the party that was more concerned about the next generation than the next election. Uh, we've gotten away from that a little bit. And right now those generations are getting uh, that, that those next generations come faster and faster because we've only got so much time to deal with the climate crisis. And there's nobody in this room that is not concerned about the climate crisis and the long-term, uh, the long-term uh, problems of racism, colonialism, and, 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 and the, the like. Uh, these are the issues is that we need to focus on. And yes, we have to, you know, and, and we are increasingly a party that is interested in bringing power to the working class, which is the vast majority of people in the United, people in the country and in the world. And, you know, yes, we need to talk about that more. Uh, these are the things that, that, that unite us, our values unite us, our pillars unite us. And yeah, we sometimes we do get caught up in the short term. Uh, I don't, I hate the term culture wars, but uh, that's been the, where, where we've been divided lately. Let's move on, let's focus on the big picture and the only picture that that we need to continue to be involved with movements and we've got us you know we're that's got to be our focus yes thanks mike all right um do any of the other cc candidates want to respond Um, so do we have any other questions or discussion 
for CC candidates. Uh, Tom Stack, just to confirm, so the the at large will will take the majority. They require a majority of the membership votes for the CD positions in the coordinating council. It just requires a majority of the people that vote in that district. Is there what if there's only three people that vote? I mean, how's that going to work? Because um, we have this. Approval voting stage in our uh, process. Um, I, I'm just reviewing the the stuff that we all, most of us already know, but not everyone that's watching this meeting knows the nuts and bolts of how the election works. So I guess the for the at large positions, what if, if we don't get a majority, then the position is not filled. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's right. Um, so. Our bylaws provide for, you know, none of the above voting. Um, and the software that we use called OpaVote uh, doesn't have good support for none of the above voting. Although, you know, it, it's basically a ranked choice voting app, but unfortunately they, you know, they have not really supported none of the above voting. Um, and, you know, so our uh, process is that candidates for the uh, according council at large positions need to be ranked by a majority of voters, because what we tell voters is that if you don't rank a candidate at all, then that's the same as voting against that candidate. Uh, it's like voting none of the above um, for that candidate. So, um, so yes, you need a candidate for that large position needs to be ranked by a majority of voters. If they're not ranked by a majority of voters, then we consider that none of the above or none of the remaining candidates, you know, has finished higher and, you know, the, the majority of candidate or voters don't support that candidate. Uh, therefore they, you know, they don't pass the threshold to win a seat. Tom, Tom Stack. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it takes a long time to unmute for some reason. Um, so in OpaVote, the, the ballot could be populated with the candidates for the position, in which case, um, like let's say there's just one person running, like Joe Nathan's the only one running. So if it's populated with his, um, you know, with his name, then people would have to pull his name off the ballot. I'm just saying psychologically, the way the ballot's constructed is um, it's going to impact the behavior. So I think we have to, I guess I would be biased towards putting all the members on the ballot um, rather than having people drag them onto the ballot. And I... I on this, but it's just, you know, it's something to think about in terms of OPA vote. Um, if there are options, we want to think about how we design the election fast. Sam Stack. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so the elections that we're using, or sorry, the settings that we're using for this election um, mirror the settings which we've used in previous elections. Um, the All the settings were provided to the coordinating council to comment on. Uh, Dave commented, um, said they look good. Uh, nobody else um, commented during that period. Uh, so we're, we're I mean, one, we're bound by the um, settings that we've agreed upon. Uh, two, um, I mean, the way that it works in OPA vote is that you add people to the ballot, um, it, not that you remove them from the ballot. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know, Tom, it, it kind of sounds like you might have some misconceptions about how the uh, how the ballots are structured pass. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, well, so no, I, I, I just sent out a comment, but let's not get stuck in the weeds. This is a technical issue. Sam said he notified the CC of the ballot settings, asked for feedback. Um, you know, people had a chance to respond and weigh in on this. And yeah, it's it's the same way that we've done it before. So, um, you know, let's please not get bogged down in the weeds. I mean, if if there are like widespread concerns about this, then um, you know, I'd be interested to hear people speak up. But Tom, I. I really don't understand why you would bring this up right now when we've been discussing it for a while now. Um, let, let's move on. I mean, we're, we're already over time. We've got other things on the agenda. Um, all right, so That basically, you know, we're at the end of the elections. Um, you know, we were scheduled to have our presentation on proportional rank choice voting at two. It's now 2.29, but we've been talking elections for the past hour and a half. So why don't we take a five minute break, reconvene at 2.35 for the presentation. Good. Does that sound okay to everyone? I'm good with that. Okay. See so you at two thirty five.
Let's do that later. <laughs> All right, so I think everyone's here, right? Um, well, except for Mike had to leave. But yeah, it's 235, so I guess without further ado. Um, so at this point, we are going to um, have, you know, first of all, a presentation on proportional rank choice voting. And then um, open up more for discussion on our theme of uh, defending and expanding democracy. Um, yeah, so I'll share my screen and um, you know kick off the uh, presentation. And um, haven't done this one before, so hopefully all will go well. So. Um, Sam, could you make me a co-host? Yes, and Barb, you know, will uh, is also asked to speak on the theme. So, uh, yes. So I've made you a co-host, Dave. Um, Barb, uh, will you also have a presentation that she'll want to do a screen share for? I can't hear you very well, but I believe you're saying yeah, that. So, yep. Yeah, so I um, I made you a co-host. Sorry, I was just asking whether Barb also um, needed the ability to do a screen share. Okay. Let's see. It's making me jump through some hoops to be able to share my screen. Okay, so sorry about that. Try to resolve this. Try it now. Mm -hmm. I locked down the screen share setting after we got Zoom bombed. So that might have been what's causing you some issues. Okay. Try that. No, it's, yeah, it's my browser. It's, uh, it says I need to grant my browser access to screen recording. Um, so. That's on um, um, system preferences, security and privacy. Ah, uh, yeah. I am. Mm, Okay. I think we may have to restart Chrome. Um, okay, maybe. Your browser. Okay. Yeah. It looks like that is true. So, um, yeah. So I guess I'm going to have to to quit Chrome and uh, yeah, and get back in. So. Sorry about this. I, you know, hopefully I'll be back in a couple of minutes. So he's, it's, so a fair number of people use the web client for Zoom. It's interesting. I thought most people use the, the client. Yes.
Okay. I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Very sorry about that. So, um, all right. I'm going to try and share my screen. Let's hope this works. All right, can people see my slideshow? Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. So this is a presentation about proportional rank choice voting and why it's the future of democracy. And uh, this is the first time I've presented on this topic. So, um, you know, I know that there will be a lot of information that might be new to people. Um, you know, if, if at any point there is anything that is very unclear to the point where, you know, you can't move forward without asking a question, then please let me know. Um, because, you know, I, I don't want people to be confused by anything. Um, you know, that said, there will definitely be time for questions after the presentation. So, you know, if you just are curious about something and it can wait, then, you know, I would ask that you hold those kinds of questions to the end. Um, but, you know, if you need to, you know, if you're really confused and need something clarified, then let me know. All right, without further ado. So proportional rank choice voting won uh, two significant wins in the 2022 election. One was in Portland, Oregon, um, you know, which is a city of, uh, I think over 150,000 people. Um, and, you know, that is uh, over 150,000 voters. No, I mean, actually I think it's, it's more than that. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's certainly the largest uh, U.S. city now to have proportional rank choice voting. And the other was Portland, Maine, um, where there was a referendum on the ballot to move from rank choice voting to proportional rank choice voting. And, you know, that won uh, nearly two thirds victory. So, Congratulations to Portland's and, you know, we need more Portland's. So what is proportional rank choice voting? Let's start with some definitions. Proportional representation is a type of electoral system in which groups of the electorate are reflected proportionately in the elected body. Rank choice voting is a voting system in which voters can rank candidates in order of preference on their ballots. So logically proportional rank choice voting is a voting system in which voters can rank candidates in order of preference, and the results are tallied to elect a proportional elected body that best represents the will of the voters. So if you just take a look at the picture on the bottom, it explains things pretty well. The current system, you, know, you have all these voters, some vote for dark green, some vote for light green, some vote for yellow, some vote for orange, but because dark green has maybe 40% of the vote, dark green wins the seat. So 100% of representation goes to 40% of voters. In a fair representation system like proportional rank choice voting, you may have the same vote result, but uh, the votes are allocated proportionately so that dark green, light green, and yellow all ended up winning seats and all those voters are represented and everyone's happier. So here are the basics of ranked choice voting. And, you know, just to be clear, I assume that, you know, here at a Green Party meeting, people are pretty familiar with ranked choice voting. And so this presentation is not gonna go very deep into it. Um, you know, and if, if people have questions or want more information about ranked choice voting, then there are lots of good resources out there. Highly recommend fairvote.org. Um, but there's many others as well. 
So anyway, ranked choice voting or RCV, voters can rank candidates in order of preference. So one, two, three, et cetera, um, instead of just voting for one, like most people do now. If no candidate gets a majority of first choices, then the last place candidate is eliminated and the ballots that rank that candidate first then go to the voter's next choice. You repeat until one candidate wins a majority. So RCB solves or greatly reduces problems like vote splitting, the spoiler effect, the lesser of two evils dilemma, wasting your vote, etc. cetera. Uh, forms of RCB have been passed in over 50 US cities and counties and three states. So again, you can go to fairvote.org for more information and resources on RCB. Some proportional representation. So that refers to a variety of election systems where parties or groups of like-minded voters gain representation in an elected body proportional to their numbers in the electorate. And proportional representation or PR is widely used in various forms in most democracies around the world and is associated with multi-party democracy. Uh, so some examples, just a few of many are Colombia, Germany, Indonesia, Israel, New Zealand, Spain, South Africa, Sweden. That gives you an idea of, you know, that democracies all over the world use proportional representation, but it's also the vast majority of democracies all over the world use proportional representation. So this graphic on the bottom, Sweden uses proportional representation, so its parliament reflects its people. And you can see on the left is how people voted for the social Democrats, moderate party, Sweden Democrats, center party, left party, Christian Democrats, liberals, green party, and others. And then you can see um, those eight parties all got seats in parliament proportional to their share of the vote. All right. So now that takes us to proportional rank choice voting. So here are the basics. First, voters rank candidates in order of preference. First choice, second choice, third choice, et cetera. Then the first choices are counted and any candidate with enough votes to pass the threshold wins a seat. And this threshold depends on how many seats are available. So for three seats, the threshold is 25% plus one. For four seats, it's 20% plus one. For five seats, it's 16.7% plus one, and so on. And then if winning candidates receive more votes than needed, which are called overvotes, then their share of overvotes is reallocated to their voters' next choices. And after overvotes are counted, candidates in last place are eliminated, and those ballots are transferred to next choices until all seats have been won. And this is simpler than it may seem at first. Uh, so let's check out an example proportional rank choice voting vote. So here we have a PRCV election with five candidates from the purple and orange parties representing various shades of purple and orange. Plum, rust, apricot, violet, and lavender. And they're competing for three available seats. So in the first round, 60% of first choice rankings go to three purple candidates, while 40% go to two orange candidates. So in the first round, Plum and Rust pass the threshold and win seats, with Plum getting more first rankings than needed. So in round two, overvotes are transferred from Plum to Violet and Lavender. So in round three, the last place candidate, which is Lavender, is eliminated, and its votes are transferred to voters' next viable choice, putting Violet over the threshold. All right, so here's the overview. 60% uh, of voters ranked purple candidates first, 40% ranked orange candidates first. So the purples won two seats and orange won one. Voters for the most popular candidate, Plum, had their overvotes transferred so that they don't count any less than votes for other candidates. 
voters for the least popular candidate, Lavender, still had their votes count for their second choice, Violets. Both purple and orange voters win representation on the council, and the seats go to the most popular candidates of each party. And so what's the deal with overvotes? Because with ranked choice voting, people are probably familiar with eliminating the last place candidate and reallocating those ballots. But when you have multi-winner elections with proportional representation, you reallocate the overvotes first. So here's why. In a multi-winner election, each candidate can only win one seat. So if a candidate gets more votes than they need to win a seat, those voters' votes would count less than other votes, unless they're transferred proportionally to their down-ballot choices. Okay, so that may sound a little confusing, but again, examples really clear it up. So say your group is deciding what to eat. So pepperoni pizza wins in a landslide, but there's only one pepperoni pizza available, and the next biggest vote-getters are chocolate and vanilla ice cream. So in a traditional election, pepperoni pizza is first place, chocolate ice cream is second place, vanilla ice cream is third place. So the, the traditional election result would be pepperoni pizza, uh, you get one pepperoni pizza, one bucket of chocolate ice cream, one bucket of vanilla ice cream. But with this proportional system, the overvote from pepperoni pizza is transferred to the next most popular pizza, yielding a proportional result of two pizzas. So that way the pizza loving majority get their fair share and the group doesn't end up with an unrepresentative result of just one pizza and two buckets of ice cream. All right, so let's go back to single winner election systems and the problems that they have. So there's the spoiler dilemma. You know, we've all heard, if you don't vote for the lesser of two evils, you'll split the vote and spoil the election. Uh, wasted votes. Any vote that doesn't go to a winner elects no one and is wasted. So in many U.S. elections, the majority of votes are wasted. When candidates win with 40% or less than 40%, then the vast majority of votes in that election are wasted. This happens a lot in U.S. elections. You have perverse incentives. So these problems incentivize voters to try to game the system to avoid the worst outcome, even when the, that means voting against what they actually want. And polls show US voters do this all the time. For example, in the 2016 election, polls show that more people were motivated to vote against Trump and against Clinton than people who were motivated to vote for either of those candidates. Um, and gerrymandering. Politicians can game election districts, they give themselves uh, to, sorry, they can game election districts to give themselves safe seats and disempower voters they don't like. Um, and Wisconsin is national poster child for gerrymandering, where, uh, you know, Republicans can lose a statewide election but still gain uh, around 70% of seats in the legislature. So ranked choice voting is a big improvement on the current system, but to solve all these problems, we need proportional ranked choice voting. So here's some of the advantages of proportional ranked choice voting and how they help solve these problems. So first, every vote counts and gains that voter representation on the elected body. So no more wasted votes. Voters can vote for any candidates they want without fear of wasting their vote or splitting the vote, leading to more representative outcomes. So no more spoiler effect, no more splitting the vote, no more throwing away your vote or, you know, whatever people say. No more, oh, I wish I could vote for a good candidate, but I'll have to vote for the lesser of two evils. Minority groups also get representation proportional to their numbers. So we don't just mean ethnic minorities or racial minorities, um, but this could also be political minorities. Uh, you know, it, some, in some districts, uh, Democrats are a minority and they uh, get no representation in elections. 
In some districts, Republicans are a minority and they get no representation in elections. Proportional representation doesn't, it's not an ideological system. What it does is it gives each group representation proportional to their numbers. So everyone feels like they have a voice, even if they're in the minority. Ranked choice voting ensures that election winners represent the majority. Proportional ranked choice voting ensures that election winners represent almost everybody. We say almost because there still is a threshold to get representation. So, um, you know, and the threshold can be higher or lower depending on the number of seats available and the system. Um, you know, you see different thresholds in different proportional representation systems. Uh, for example, in Germany, there are about five main parties in the parliament because they have a higher threshold. And, you know, as we saw in Sweden, there's more like eight or nine parties. And in the Netherlands, there's even more and, and Norway because the threshold is lower. So even groups that get a small percentage of the vote. Um, but, you know, as we'll see in Ireland, they have proportional ranked choice voting for their parliament and they have a lot of parties represented and they have a lot of independence as well. Um, proportional representation eliminates gerrymandering because when legislatures are elected proportionally, it removes the incentive to try to draw district lines strategically to disempower certain groups of voters. And I really want to emphasize this because we should talk about it way more than we do. Single winner systems can't eliminate gerrymandering. Only proportional representation can. There have been attempts to eliminate gerrymandering in single winner systems, and they have been failures. Um, and there's no, there's no way to, um, or even if there, there were a way to do it, both parties are so guilty of gerrymandering that neither one of them trusts the other one to draw what you know, we might think of as fair districts. And rightfully so, because um, both the Democrats and Republicans, whenever they get power, have used it to uh, gerrymander in their favor as much as they can. Um, but gerrymandering is a huge problem. And people talk about it a lot, especially in states like Wisconsin. And we really need to be very loud and vocal about this mathematical fact that only proportional representation can eliminate gerrymandering. Is the US today a real democracy? Spoiler alert, no. Um, over 60% of US adults believe the two party system does such a poor job representing the people that a new major party is needed. Um, we know that from Gallup polls, and that's been um, consistent over the last few years. 74% believe the U.S. is headed in the wrong direction. Um, that's even more damning. A study by Northwestern and Princeton researchers found that U.S. government policy is determined by the interests of the super rich, while the interests of the vast majority of people have little to no effect on policy. So... You know, and you see the, uh, the article on the right, major study finds the U.S. is an oligarchy. Uh, if the majority of people in the U.S. believe that the government doesn't represent them, and the data proves this to be the case, then is the U.S. really a democracy? We don't have a U.S. system. So here's why we need proportional representation for real democracy. In the current system, the lesser of two evils dynamic means politicians can get elected simply by opposing the other party. Gerrymandering means many elections are foregone conclusions. Party leaders hold all the power. Voters feel powerless to change the system. Many give up on voting. With proportional RCV, voters elect the candidates who best represent them not just the, the lesser of two evils. Gerrymandering is obsolete because the minority also gets fair representation. Voters are incentivized to vote because every vote counts. 
Voters are empowered and politicians are much more accountable to voters. Let's talk a little bit about the history of proportional RCV in the US because it's interesting history, but uh, very little known. So a little known fact, in the first half of the 20th century, two dozen US cities implemented PRCV, including Cincinnati, Cleveland, Boulder, Sacramento, and New York City. But PRCV was targeted for repeal during the Red Scare of the 1950s because members of leftist parties and people of color were getting elected. In other words, PRCV was too successful at breaking up the two-party monopoly and electing people who actually represented their communities. So, and, uh, you know, here we have a news clipping from the former mayor of Cincinnati, Theodore M. Berry, who was, um, you know, an African-American mayor um, in the 50s, even before the civil rights movement, really was taking the country by storm, who was a big advocate of proportional representation. And again, members of leftist parties and people of color started getting elected and the political establishment used this to say proportional representation is communism and get it repealed. So where is proportional, represent, uh, proportional RCV used now? So U.S. cities in, using PRCV for some local elections include Albany, California, Arden, Delaware, Cambridge, Massachusetts, East Point, Michigan, Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, Palm Desert, California, and Amherst, Massachusetts. As I mentioned, it's just been passed in Portland, Oregon, and Portland, Maine. PRCV, which is sometimes called single transferable vote, is also used in various elections in Ireland, Australia, Scotland, New Zealand, and Malta. Ireland's parliament, which is elected by PRCV in 2022, has representatives of nine different parties as well as 24 independents. Australia's Senate, elected by PRCV in 2022, has seven different parties plus one independent. Australia's House of Representatives, with members elected in single winner RCV races, has more members but is less proportional and more dominated by Australia's two largest parties. So what about other reforms? Well, let's talk about partial RCV, New York City style. So New York City passed RCV, but only for primaries and special elections. This allows New York City's dominant party, the Democrats, to avoid splitting the vote in crowded primaries and ensures that primary winners have support from the majority of primary voters. However, New York City doesn't use RCV in general elections. So the Democrats can keep running as the lesser evil and claiming a vote for any other party or independent makes it easier for Republicans to win. So this partial RCV rationalizes competition within the establishment parties while maintaining the disincentives to viable competition from outside the two-party system. Could partial RCV be a gateway to full RCV and even PRCV? We'll see. Obviously, we want to push for that outcome, but it's much better to um, have measures that enact RCV for general elections right away. We don't want to get stuck where New York City is now. So what about other reforms like top two or top four or top five primaries? So the top two primary in California and Washington state is a jungle primary where the top two vote getters advance to general election. And top two has virtually eliminated alternative parties and independents outside the two party system from general elections. So recent initiatives in Alaska and, and Nevada are final four or final five systems. So in these systems, you have a jungle primary with choose one voting. Then the top four or five candidates advance to the general election, which uses RCV. So there's been limited experience in Alaska so far. They've only started using uh, Final Four this year. But that limited experience shows that the two establishment parties dominate Final Four. Well, meanwhile, in Maine, ranked choice voting elections have been more diverse with 
um, with more independent candidates and uh, Greens and Libertarians making it to the general election. And final four is being promoted by centrist reformers with business ties. And could it end up entrenching the two party system? That you know, seems like a possibility based on the experience so far. And we want reforms that give us more choices, not more of the same. Uh, even with final five, you could end up with two Democrats, two Republicans, and an independent billionaire. That's not really much different than the choices we have now. So what about other reforms like nonpartisan elections? Nonpartisan elections was a popular reform enacted for many local elections in the 20th century to try to reduce the influence of parties over elections. The problem is that with the two party systems top down stranglehold on political power, the establishment parties still dominate politics at every level. Some people ask, why can't we just ban political parties? First of all, because the constitution guarantees the right to political ascendant. Even if you remove partisan labels from ballots or try to suppress political parties, people will still find ways to organize together for common interests. The solution is not to ban parties or try to destroy them. It's to change the system to encourage a healthy multi-party democracy with real choices. And what about other reforms like approval voting? So approval voting is this voting system where voters can approve as many candidates as they want and the candidate with most approvals wins. AV advocates claim it's better than RCV for electing consensus candidates. However, like all single winner systems, AV has some problems. Voters afraid that approving more candidates will hurt their favorite candidates. Voters trying to game the system by bullet voting for just their favorite candidate. Questions about constitutionality because not all votes have equal weight. AV has only passed in Fargo, North Dakota, and St. Louis, Missouri, so there's limited data so far. But in a recent AV versus RCV vote in Seattle, voters preferred RCV three to one. RCV is a first step to proportional RCV, but AV doesn't work well as a PR system. Why PRCV and not other forms of PR? Good question. There are other excellent forms of PR, including the mixed member proportional system used in Germany and New Zealand that combines proportional party representation with local elected representatives. One idea is that passing RCV in single winner elections can be the first step to PRCV. Portland, Maine may be the first modern city to go from RCV to PRCV. Many reformers also believe US voters would prefer a system of voting for individual candidates instead of parties. Paradoxically, even though most voters habitually vote for the two establishment parties, their game of vote the lesser of two evils has understandably given US voters a distaste for parties. So too long, didn't read version. PRCV is a great system with a proven track record and many election reformers consider it the most viable form of PR for the US. There's even a bill to bring PRCV to Congress called the Fair Representation Act. Fair Representation Act would establish proportional ranked choice voting for the US House of Representatives, with each representative being elected from a three to five member district. And the Fair Representation Act would be a huge step towards a healthy multi-party system and real democracy in the US. So again, we see with the current system, all this diversity of voters, and you get one candidate representing one party in a fair representation system like PRCV, you get a diversity of representatives that truly represents what those voters stand for. And not because they're the lesser evil, you know, they, because voters are free to vote for what they want, then th these winners truly represent what, what people are voting for. So it's a race to the top instead of a race to the bottom. Okay. So that concludes my um, presentation on proportional ranked choice voting. Um, so 
like to open it up for any questions and discussion at this point. Kingfisher stack. Go ahead. I'm really impressed with um, the takeaway statement. So uh, the the cure to gerrymandering is proportional rank choice voting. Yes, proportional representation in general. Um, but yeah, proportional rank choice voting would solve the gerrymandering problem. Um, yeah, and you know, if it's not clear why single winner systems um, are always vulnerable to gerrymandering versus why proportional representation is solves gerrymandering, then can explain that in a little more depth, but but yeah, that's that's a, an important, really important takeaway. The only way to solve gerrymandering is proportional representation. No oh, kingfisher stack. Yeah, uh, I see um, really well organized political graphic yard signs and other signage uh, where people are very invested in put money behind advertising against gerrymandering. And to, to take that very clear connection, uh, the ranked choice proportional voting, that, that is you know, a really uh, clear sounding, uh, yeah, that is crisp connection. And I, I, I can see that, um, you know, really playing out uh, in the public, uh, especially with graphics and uh, right visibility. So um, really appreciate uh, the gravity of, of that. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, yeah, it's a really, you know, it, it is an important issue and people understandably are very unhappy with gerrymandering because it literally disempowers voters and, um, you know, it, it's a power grab. Um, yeah, so it's, it's important to get into that conversation and, you know, really explain to people that, um, gerrymandering is, it's a feature of single winner systems. It's not a bug. And with, uh, with single winner elections, you'll never get rid of gerrymandering. Um, and, you know, we've, we've seen that in the experience of states that have, supposedly tried reforms. Um, I think, you know, New York is a good example um, of a state where they said that they were going to get rid of gerrymandering and, you know, ended up just trying to gerrymander in the opposite direction. And then, you know, their new map was thrown out and it went back to the old gerrymandered map. Um, I don't know if I, uh, if I got that 100% accurately because... <laughs> there are a lot of twists and turns in that story, but basically, you know, there are states that Republicans are gerrymandered like Wisconsin, for example, and then Democrats say, Hey, well, we're against gerrymandering. We want to, uh, we want to end gerrymandering. But then when they come into power, as we've seen in state after state, then the Democrats, what they do is um, they gerrymander the state for their own power. So of course the Republicans, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, it's a standoff type situation where, you know, they say, you know, if we, if we put our weapon down, then you'll just point yours at our head. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, you know, we, uh, we oppose the Republicans on many, many issues and, um, you know, living in a Republican gerrymandered state is really bad. Um, but what we want is not just to, uh, you know, end up like New York or California where the Democrats control everything. But we, you know, we want real democracy where everyone is represented and, you know, even voters in the minority um, get some representation and by the very nature of the system, it's impossible to say, 
hey, we don't like these voters. We're going to just game the system so that their votes don't count. But yeah, I, I, I don't want to go on and on, but I, I, I do also want to say, you know, there's a lot of talk about gerrymandering. There's a lot of talk about election reform, you know, now, as I mentioned, some of these other reforms, like the, particularly the final four or final five are gaining steam and, you know, we need to get our voices out on these issues and, and really, you know, argue for what we want you know, argue for a system that's the gold standard, because there is a danger that, um, you know, reforms will move forward. Even people who are well-meaning will say, okay, let's, let's pass these reforms. And, you know, they'll end up uh, not delivering what they're, what they're saying. And um, yeah. And, you know, you might only get one bite at the apple. So we need, we, you know, really need to get out front on these movements. Pass. Yes, I understand. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I see Barb's on stack. Am I unmuted? Yeah, you, we're unmuted. Um, so how, say we had, um, you know, in the, uh, like, districts, congressional District districts, we would have to have more than one winner to get the proportional voting. How would that practically be implemented, like over a geographic area like Wisconsin? You have all the different assembly districts and so forth. What would be what would be the happy solution to that? You know, like how many? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a very good question. So. Um, you know, you basically, you go from uh, single member districts to multi-member districts. So you can keep the same number of legislators and just reorganize the districts. Basically you can, you know, for example, for the state assembly, you could keep the same number of members and just expand the districts so that, um, you know, for example, instead of voting for just one person in a smaller district, you would you would elect three members or maybe five members from a larger district. Um, another option is to increase the number of legislators. Um, so, for example, you could keep the the same number of districts, but have each of those districts elect uh, three legislators. Um, in fact, I, I believe New Hampshire does something kind of like this, although they're not, um, I don't think they're full time and I don't even know what they're paid, but they elect more than one legislator from each district and they, they have a relatively large legislature. Um, and for the U.S. House, you know, a lot of there are reformers um, who are calling to uncap the House, meaning, uh, you know, about 100 years ago, they said, OK, we're going to cap the size of the House of Representatives at 435. Um, before that, the House had been growing. And now it doesn't grow. So but the population keeps growing. So basically every year each person in the house represents more and more people. And, you know, as a result, they basically become further and further from the people they represent, um, cost more and more money to, to run a campaign in those massive districts. Um, and of course there's a lot of people who don't feel represented at all by the people who are there. So, um, yeah, so basically some people are saying, well, why not elect three uh, members of Congress from each district and triple the number of members of Congress? So, you know, that could be a solution. We definitely see in, in some other countries, they have much larger legislative bodies than we tend to. 
And in the U.S., there's a huge amount of variation. So Madison, for example, is a um, uh, you know mid-sized city. Some people would say small city, with um, I believe 21 members on the city council. Uh, Seattle is a much larger city and has, I believe, six members of the city council. Um, LA is a huge city and has a very small city council. Um, so, you know, these, these are massive races. Um, and I've heard that, you know, in some California districts, it might be the California State Senate, their districts are even larger than House of Representatives districts. So these are massive districts. And to, you know, to win a majority of votes in these districts costs a huge amount of money to win the primary, to, uh, you know, to get your message out to all these people. Um, and yeah, you know, a lot of these problems would be, um, would be solved or, you know, improved on by increasing the size of our legislative bodies and um, making them proportional. But just to, for a final word on this topic, um, for the Fair Representation Act, which um, would enact PRCV for Congress, um, fair vote has argued that the ideal um, the ideal size for districts would be three to five members. Um, and they have a lot more information on that. So I'll pass. Um, Barb, did you have something or were you getting on stack for Tom? Um, I, that was Tom stack, but um, if you're done and I, I had a few remarks um, before we open it up. I think there's still is some discussion on, on this topic. So um, um, Bruce on stack. Yeah. Yeah. I see, I see Bruce and Jeff are on stack. So if, if people have questions or comments on proportional rank choice voting, then let's um, let's stay on that for, for right now. And then, um, you know, once, once we get through all the questions and comments, then we can, Go over to Barb. Um, so Bruce, you're up. Okay. Uh, for many years, the Greens have been going, oh, I wish we had proportional representation like to do in Europe. Or then came rank choice purity voting and, and oh, I wish we had a parliament. You know, and um, I have a problem with RCV in general, simply because um, it requires computers. I don't see how you can do millions of votes in a statewide election mm -hmm. in a system that's complicated about computers. And we already know, I mean, there's pretty much evidence that computers are capital. This whole thing they had in um, Maricopa County in Arizona this last last week. That was ridiculous. I mean, it's a big county, but the entire country of France can do an election in one day on paper ballots. Matter of fact, computers aren't used in very many places. And I I I pity the person trying to figure out rank choice voting on paper ballots. The other thing is that it's not what people understand, it's not what they're used to. And that's a huge educational campaign. And finally, a lot of these things that require um, constitutional amendments to state constitutions. And that's not gonna happen. The Democrats aren't gonna give us that. The Republicans aren't gonna give us that. They're not gonna do anything to change there are uh, advantages they have already. So it's always been my feeling, some 35 years now, that this is just a way to avoid doing what we need to do, which is learn how to compete in the existing system. 
if we can actually get some people into the legislature or the National House of Representatives or something like that, then we'd have a platform start proposing some of these ideas. But I think what we got to do is we got to learn how to work and make it through the current system. And on top of that, there's just so much money in politics. We all know that. And how are we going to get ranked choice voting? Where are we going to get the money to promote ranked choice voting? You know, the powers that be will just shut it down, kind of, you know, they'll cancel it from Facebook and Twitter if they have to. No, they'll just do that. So it's a nice ideological high in the sky ideas but they're not very pragmatic. And I wish this party would just learn how to deal with what is, and that is the current system that we have. All right, well, let me respond point by point. Um, so first of all, uh, you said that ranked choice voting needs computers to work. Um, actually, I mentioned Ireland is the um, is you know the largest country that uses entirely ranked choice voting and specifically proportional ranked choice voting, and they don't use computers. It's all hand counted paper ballots, and they've done this for over a hundred years. Um, so, yeah, you don't need computers. Um, you can use computers uh, because some people say, oh, well hand counting ballots takes too much time and especially if they're ranked choice voting. Well, you know, unfortunately that is kind of a dominant view in the U S but what you can do is you can have uh, paper ballots that are machine counted. And uh, you know, when that is the case, like in Alaska, um, then it takes about one minute for the computers to count those after they've counted the paper ballots, it takes uh, about one minute or less for them to tabulate the ranked choice voting. Um, so when people say, oh, ranked choice voting takes too long, um, no, it doesn't. It takes um, one minute. Uh, but you still have the paper ballots that can be hand counted. You know, if you want to do a recount, if you want to verify for purposes of election integrity, um, then yeah, I, I agree that we should have uh, voter verifiable paper ballots. Um, you know, in an ideal world, I would support hand counting. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think we can certainly compromise with people who want uh, election results on election night. And that is entirely doable. And, um, and people do it. Um, so another point that saying that it's not practical I mean, actually ranked choice voting has won over 80% of the elections where people have, have voted on it. And, um, you know, it's one of the fastest growing movements in the U S. Uh, so now over 50 cities and counties and three states have voted for ranked choice voting. Um, you know, and you know, so winning statewide elections, um, that is a big deal. But, you know, a lot of these groups have done it, you know, basically as grassroots groups. Um, so, and, you know, also the studies show that when people learn about ranked choice voting, they think it's simple. Then when they use it, they know it's simple. They like it more, the more that they use it. They want to use it more, the more that they use it. Um, they don't want to go back to the old system after using ranked choice voting. So uh, it's very practical and, um, you know, it's a, it's a reform that is, has a winning record. Um, you know, believe me, I wish that we had Greens elected in state legislatures and in Congress and, you know, that we could stand up against the big money and all that. Um, you know, right now, the, it's not just the Green Party. The fact is that the movement for ranked choice voting has a very high win percentage, uh, whereas uh, campaigns outside the two party system, you know, when you get above the local level, 
um, have a much, much harder time um, getting wins. So, and, you know, I think any of us who have been involved with the Green Party for any period of time, we know that, you know, probably the biggest obstacle to our growth is, you know, the whole spoiler argument and people saying, well, we like everything that you stand for, but we can't vote for your party because it's a two party system only. And we have to vote defensively for the lesser evil or the greater evil will win. You know, that is something that, you know, in my opinion, it's the number one thing that has held back um, independent politics in this country and ranked choice voting uh, helps with that a lot, but proportional ranked choice voting would really, um, you know, totally change the game. And this just happened in Portland, Oregon and Portland, Maine, you know, so those are two and, uh, you know, a number of other places. Uh, people in Nevada just voted for a constitutional amendment to the state constitution uh, to implement ranked choice voting. Um, you know, so I think this is very practical. Um, you know, it's a, it's a uh, movement that is gaining momentum. Um, but like I said, we have to be out front and, and steer it in the right direction uh, because otherwise we could end up with some, you know, half reforms that kind of shuffle around the deck chairs in the Titanic, but don't actually move us to real healthy multi-party democracy. Um, but you're confirming that computers still are needed to make the calculations even with paper ballots. No, uh, that's not what I said at all. Uh, as I said, in Ireland, they use proportional ranked choice voting and it's entirely done with a hand count. Uh, so no computers are needed. And they've done this for around 100 years. Um, so before computers were invented, they were using proportional ranked choice voting. Um, no, it's just, it's just math, uh, just like any other election. Um, and yeah. Okay. Uh, so I see that Jeff and Bill are on stack. Jeff, go right ahead. Okay, this is John. I know I sound a little bit crazy here with this, but um, um, you know, we got to keep in mind that, that um, you know, I'm kind of a railroad guy here. Um, so I always talk about things in terms of railroads. And so, uh, you know, they call the Northeast Corridor the NEC. And so ever since Amtrak took over, um, NEC actually is a, an acronym for nothing else counts. So I was thinking in order to effectively do what we want to do, we need a new capital. And you know, the, the one we got burned down back in, during uh, the war of 1812. So, um, putting up a new uh, national capital wouldn't be impossible. <clears throat> what I'm thinking about is why don't we, why is the, why is our national capital in Washington and not someplace that's a little easier to get to? Um, why not Kansas City? You know, they thought about, um, um, you know, there, there's a lot of room down in that in the stockyard area in Kansas City. <clears throat> um, so we'd have, I, I kind of did some numbers here. And so if you take 435 and uh, multiple, multiply it by three, you get uh, 1,305. Uh, not an impossible number to deal with, but we need, we need more room. Uh, plus there's another factor that nobody seems to be 
uh, thinking about, and that is we've got uh, not only 50 states, but we've got uh, one district and we've got five um, uh, territories, including places like um, Puerto Rico, which is hugely populated, Virgin Islands, Guam, North Mariana Islands, and uh, let's see, I'm missing one here. Um, um, okay. Um, okay. We should be looking at not 50, 50 states, but 56 states. <clears throat> the places that are not getting represented <clears throat> at all. Washington, D.C. Okay. Um, just too many places that aren't getting represented. <clears throat> Plus the fact that if you, you know, whether you're traveling from Baltimore, Maryland to Washington or all the way from Honolulu to Washington, I mean, <clears throat> too many, uh, the, the, it's just, uh, we need a, a central location for all of this. So just putting some things out there. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to say a great talk. Uh, I just thought if somebody wants to build on that, that would be great. Uh, as an idea, let's let's look at geographics. All right, and with that, I'll pass. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I see that um, Bill was on stack. Hey, Bill. Yeah, Bruce says that we, the Green Party, need to learn how to work more effectively in the current system, and of course, that's true. And that's true because we have not won the battle for democracy yet. And we are stuck, most parts of the country, with our antiquated and anti-democratic system that freezes out minority groups and movements and uh, freezes everything into the two-party system. Um, but really, we need to be what the Green Party was initially conceived as, and that is a radical democratic party. We need to really set the standard. We need to be in the vanguard in the fight for expanding democracy. And this is a route that we've got to uh, travel on, um, ranked choice voting and pro uh, pro proportional representation. And it's really not ideological. A lot of Areas around the country have figured this out. A lot of countries in the world, civilized nations, as opposed to the U.S., have figured this out and have learned that this is the, the course and the route to a far more democratic society. And we need to get on board with this. And I really appreciate this educational because I learned an awful lot here. And I think I'm probably in a better position to explain what it is and how it works and how it will benefit people as a result of this educational. So um, I'll just pass on that. Yeah, thanks, Bill. And yeah, and so, you know, I, I see the comment says, my experience over many, many years, many conversations, people have told me that they like what we stand for We've been unable to elect anyone and they can't afford to gamble on a vote for the Greens because their issues are too important and they need a winner. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. Um, that's exactly you know, what I was trying to say. Um, you know, it, there's a number of different ways that people express the, uh, the spoiler argument or, you know, the spoiler dilemma. You know, they, they talk about, uh, splitting the vote or wasting a vote, throwing away your vote on a third party. Um, I like you guys, but you can't win. Uh, it's a, it's a two party system. You got to change it from the inside. Um, 
you know, we can't, we can't gamble on this one. You know, this is, this election is too important. Maybe next time. Um, and the thing is that with, with ranked choice voting, it's no longer a gamble because people aren't worried like, Oh, you know, the Democrats need my vote to stop Donald Trump or to stop Tim Michaels or to stop Ron Johnson um, or any of these other, uh, you know, terrible right wing fools. Um, you know, I, I worked on a ranked choice voting election in Maine and, you know, people didn't say this stuff. They said, oh, yeah. I like your candidate. I like Lisa Savage. I'll rank her first. Um, and then, you know, if she doesn't win, then my vote will still count. So that's cool. We still had some people who didn't understand the system. And, you know, so they would come at us with the old arguments and we would say, actually, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> and then it, it was amazing. A lot of people would say, oh, I'm really sorry that I kind of, came at you aggressively and said, oh, you have to drop out. I'm going to look at your candidate and, you know, because I like the things that she says. So maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll consider doing what you say, rank her first, rank, you know, give someone else my backup choice. So it really, it changes the dynamic a lot. Um, unfortunately, Maine only has RCB for federal elections because of, you know, constitutional issues that they're dealing with. So, you know, fair vote is trying to work on all fronts. You know, there's been a lot of um, success for ranked choice voting um, through the initiative process. Um, but we're now starting to see there are some, there is some movement in the right direction. I think Arlington, Virginia recently became the first uh, legislative body to actually adopt ranked choice voting all on its own without a citizen vote. So it's kind of like what we saw with marijuana legalization. It, you know, at first it won in a bunch of cities, but they can't really change the law. But then it started winning in states. And once enough states passed it, then the politicians started saying, okay, yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, people want this. Okay. And now, and, you know, so we've had some states start to do it even without the initiative process. So we're starting to get there with the ranked choice voting movement. Um, and, you know, fair vote is pushing, for example, in Minnesota that, you know, that's a state where the twin cities have ranked choice voting for years. Um, a bunch of other cities in Minnesota are passing ranked choice voting. Now, um, you know, there's a lot of support for it and, and, you know, fair vote is trying to see if they can advance statewide ranked choice voting through the, um, you know, through the legislative process and we'll see how it goes. But, but actually, you know, when they had, a, an initiative in Massachusetts, so People point to that and say, oh, Massachusetts is a, a blue state, but ranked choice voting is still lost. Well, I think the main reason why that happened is because um, they had this grassroots organization that had laid all the groundwork for a big statewide campaign, and they were going to canvas the whole state and you know, push hard for ranked choice voting. And then they got on the ballot, and as soon as they got on the ballot, then the pandemic hit. And, you know, lockdowns, um, all, all events were canceled. Um, people didn't, you know, didn't want to go out. They didn't want anyone showing up at their door. Um, I mean, we all remember what it was like. And so the, you know, the, the massive outreach campaign that they had planned uh, basically just went out the window. And so they ended up, you know, if they had been able to swing another five or 6% of voters, um, then they would have won that. But the thing is like, yeah, if you want to change the system from what people know and have used their entire life, then you need to educate them. And what these campaigns have shown, I mean, they've won in Alaska, 
uh, Maine and Nevada. So it's shown that if you do that outreach, then you can win in purple states and red states and, uh, you know, all, a lot of different places. Um, but yeah. So, um, uh, I see Tom is on stack. Go ahead, Tom. Um, do you want to, all right. Can you hear? Yep. Yeah. Real quick question. Uh, I had had a problem with, uh, Zoom slowed down to a crawl, and I was, it was like, I felt like I was back in 1980, just typing. And no oh, we can hear you fine. It wasn't working, but uh, you were showing us proportional rank choice voting, and it was very good and so forth. I guess one thing is the overvote. If you go over that again, in my mind's eye, I was thinking maybe that's like the uh, case where you have the winner's got a surplus of both down a certain amount. And they get proportionally, fractionally assigned, but maybe I'm wrong. And then the other one is. Um, I didn't put what, out any what, coffee what or of, tea. Would you like some tea? What what type of fraction of um, proportional ring choice voting? Because there's all these different like Scottish and Oakland, and you know which one were you showing? And maybe you could just give people an overview of the variations. Uh, Pass. Yeah, that no, that's a good question. And um, yeah, honestly, I'm not quite sure um, if the uh, the graphics that I was showing are, you know, I, I don't know if it's one system versus the other because there are some basic principles in proportional rank choice voting that stay the same. Yeah, um, you're correct that there can be slight variations in the tallying system. But your question about overvotes is a really good one. So yeah, just to kind of explain it one more. So say, for example, if you have an election with five winners and you know, say there, again, there's like two parties, the purple party and the orange party. And the purple party is more popular than the orange party. And the leader of the purple party is super popular. Uh, you know, so all of the purple party voters give their first vote to the leader of the purple party. And then the orange party kind of spreads out their vote among, you know, five different candidates. So then when you, when you, uh, tally up all the votes, the biggest stack goes to the leader of the purple party. And then the next biggest stacks are all orange party. And then you've got smaller votes for the other members of the purple party. So the leader of the purple party is so popular, they got all the first place votes from the purple party members. So the other purple party members are behind, but you don't eliminate them yet because the purple party is still the most popular. Um, but because all the purple party members gave their first vote to their leader, um, they got a big overvote. So, yeah. So if they just elected that one person and then their ballots got tossed, then their votes would count less than everyone else's. So to make it proportional, that's why you need to reallocate the overvotes. Um, so to answer your second question, it's a really, really good one. Um, so the, the fairest and most proportional way to transfer the overvotes is, it's a pretty simple mathematical equation. But basically, you know, say the candidate got twice as many votes as they need. All right, then the, the fairest way to allocate the overvotes is to take every single ballot in that stack and then look at their second choice and say, okay, 50% of their vote is going to count for their second choice. 
because only 50% of their vote was needed to elect this candidate in the first place. So what you get is a fractional transfer. And sometimes, yeah, so you end up with not whole numbers being transferred, but it's still proportional and every, every person's vote still counts um, exactly the same. Um, so does that count uh, then for the second person could the same like recursively could the same yes yeah so um yeah so there can be multiple fractional transfers uh and you know there are mathematical formulas to keep it proportional and basically yeah so if there's like um you know a really big overvote and you know so first the everyone in the purple party votes for the leader and then everyone's second choice is the deputy leader right so they win but they still have an overvote then it keeps transferring but but yeah so you basically um you know it's a there's a an equation to figure out how to do it the other way to do it is to basically say okay they have 1,000 um, surplus votes. So we're going to pick 1,000 ballots at random from their pile and go to the second choice. Um, so that may, for um, certain kind of people, that may be more satisfying because you, you now have a whole number of votes that are transferred. Um, but, you know, of course, if you're picking at random, then, uh, you know, it's not a, it's not as proportional. It still will tend to balance out statistically. Um, but, you know, you might, you might get a different result, like in a very close election, if you pick the surplus votes at random versus do a fractional transfer, yeah, it might it might change the results somewhat. Um, probably not um, drastically, but but yeah. So you know, I would I would be in favor of doing fractional transfers because you know if you uh, pass middle school math, then you can understand that that is uh, an entirely logical and fair way to do it. And the the fairest and most logical way to do it, but yeah, it's not the only way to do it. Uh, Tom Stack. Yeah, go ahead. I was just thinking to myself, if you're going to do this uh, proportional with the districts, I I would think we want to shoot for at least four. Per you know, like you got the the Dems, the Republicans, and then two additional parties, right? I mean. I'm just thinking out loud. I don't. I don't know what the logic mm -hmm. would be, but um, mm -hmm. and then of course people would argue, okay, yeah, that's going to cost more money. But I think in general the idea of increasing the number of reps, like maybe that that's where we should be spending our money, is that having more people, uh, you know, representing us. Uh, what do other people think about that, Pass? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, first of all, I think if we had a proportional system, then the Democrats and Republicans would not have such a stranglehold on the system. But, you know, they probably would still, um, you know, maintain some power. Um, yeah, I, I would support larger. I mean, so right now in Cambridge, Massachusetts, for example, they, they basically have an at-large election for the city council and there are nine seats. So you basically need like 10% plus one to win a seat. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that's great. Um, I, th I would be happy personally if we had districts uh, of five people, um, you know, in an election like that, you need one sixth of the vote plus one to win a seat. Um, you know, I absolutely think if, if people could vote their true preferences, um, then, you know, the, the Green Party could absolutely be competitive with the Democrats and Republicans and, 
you know, whoever else, forward party, libertarians. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, in, uh, in Portland, Oregon, they have, I think, four districts with three, uh, with three members. So you need to win uh, 25% plus one to win one of those seats. Um, and again, you know, in a proportional rank choice voting uh, scenario, winning 25% plus one sounds a lot more doable than trying to win a majority under a first past the post voting system. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Well, yeah. Thanks everyone. Um, and appreciate you, uh, giving me the floor for this. Um, you know, it was really interesting to research and, um, I'm glad that you asked some really, really good questions. And, you know, part of it was like, I was like, wow, there's so much interesting stuff and, um, so much that I could talk about. And I had to, you know, choose kind of what to focus on here. Um, so, uh, but I'm glad that some of the, some of those topics came up in the questions, but anyway, so I'll, I'll hand it over to Barbara. Uh, I'm going to step out for just a minute. I'll be right back, but, um, but yeah, I'll hand it over to Barb and then, you know, we can open it up. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, I learned a lot from that talk as well. I thought that it, um, this is a really good discussion. Um, but I guess what I want to talk about is how we don't need to have some uh, system that we put in place in order to be heard. And um, even just taking having the practice of getting ourselves um, to speak and be heard on a regular basis is important in itself. Um, and as we do it, as we practice it, not only do we get better at what we want to say as a, as a group, um, but our message is heard better. Um, I think it's something like three to five times for regular advertisers that they want to have their message heard by somebody who's listening. Um, if we think of ourselves as advertisers, we want to get our message out um, multiple, have time to digest it um, and hear it. You want to get your tea. Um, so I volunteered to speak today about democracy because I've been heading the elections committee for about four years. And um, I have an admission to make that I actually got here in a very undemocratic way because I was appointed to the elections committee having volunteered to help and I began to chair because the chair was just absent and I default became the chair. So I might not be the best person to chair this committee. And I think that we have a lot of good people here that could do this job and uh, at least um, learn the ropes and become the next um, elections chair. And while I haven't been here as long as Nancy Pelosi, or somebody like that. Um, I'm not a, a dictator or a dynastic member. Uh, I feel like the committee would be better served if we did swap, switch around these positions. Um, so I, I do want to encourage people to step up and um, do some elections committee leadership work um, because it's not just little old me that has some important ideas about elections and be becoming heard, but I think a lot of us do and that we can practice that. And I also want us to think about how we aren't spoilers. In fact, anybody who voted for Hillary Clinton because they thought she was the lesser evil completely wasted their vote. Not only did she not win, uh, they didn't even want her in the first place. <laughs> she was the um, lesser evil in their opinion. She wasn't actually what they wanted. 
and they wasted their vote and didn't even get her. So that is, that's a major talking point for us to think about is all of these people who they think of themselves, they think that any Democrat automatically deserves our vote and that we're automatically a spoiler. I think that the, that Hillary Clinton spoiled it for us because we actually had the ideas that Americans wanted, just like so many other Democrat candidates who say that they're going to give us Medicare for all or um, a student loan forgiveness and things like that, that they say that they're going to give us these things. And we know outright that they're lying. They never intended to. In fact, just less than a week after the midterm elections, we learned that even the, the piddly little $10,000 to $20,000 off of student loans, that's not going to happen for us. And um, ro- codifying Roe v. Wade, which they all ran on, not going to happen. Um, and they're still giving billions to Ukraine. None of our priorities are even at all in the Democrats' minds. And this is at every single level. So I would highly push back on the idea that we're spoilers or a wasted vote, or even that the Democrats are the lesser evil. Um, They're evil pretty much just as as much, or if not more than the Republicans, because at least when the Republicans are in office, people are paying attention and they don't allow as much to slip past. It, It was Obama that expanded our wars from three to seven and um, expanded the, um, the immigration, the deportation of migrants and put kids in cages. And we only really cared about it when Trump was in office. And now that uh, Biden's in office again, it's just like nobody cares all of a sudden. Like these things aren't bad when Democrats do them, but they're terrible when Republicans do. And I don't think that most Americans, certainly we don't buy that. So all of these ideas that we've been sold, that um, there is a lesser evil, that we need to compromise on everything, that we need to compromise away clean water, that we could, we should compromise away the entire world because of um that we should compromise on having a nuclear war. These things are not for us to compromise away. And we're not, um, it's, it's ridiculous to call us a spoiler or a wasted vote. And this is at every single level. Um, So we think about, I, I like to talk in the national politics level of things because no matter where you are in the country, you kind of get that. But it's really the same no matter what level you go to. So if you look at the federal budget, we spend more than half of our budget on the military. If you look at the state budget, I mean, quite a bit of that is spent on security and policing and um, also, you know, giving away all of our money to these private public partnerships rather than um, jobs programs that are public publicly funded and public support for people. And the same on the local level. Uh, I was there at a budget meeting for Milwaukee a few years ago, just before the pandemic, and they were about to give half of the budget to the police. It's the same exact thing all the way down the chain. Um, And they're happy to give tons and tons of money to um, stadium building and um, for these TIF districts for private banks and things can just grab up public money and beautify the buildings and do whatever they like. And when it comes to the people who are literally out on the street in the winter, when it comes to, you know, all of the needs of the poorest of us, the people who are struggling to keep a, a roof over their head and food in their bellies, they never get any of the funding. It's always the big banks and, and always um, the police forces. And that's on purpose because you have to have somebody to keep all of these people in line if you're not going to let them survive. Um, so this is, it's really vital for us to keep our voices and speak up. Um, I was looking for this quote and I had heard it a whole bunch of times 
It's apparently attributed to Rosa Luxemburg, but you can't really find where it came from. But the quote goes like this, those who do not move do not notice their chains. And that's extremely important to us because even if we were living in a beautiful society where everybody had what they needed and um, we just didn't have to speak up or say anything, um, our role as Greens is to practice in this system to speak up every time, every election, every chance that we get so that we realize that those chains are there, that we can see them. Um, and one of the reasons that I came to the Green Party and I have stayed through the time that I have is because I saw how important the Green Party has been in strengthening our nation's democracy. That is the Green Party that has stood against extreme consequences to smash the illusion that we have a democracy at all. In 2000, Ralph Nader was threatened with arrest for trying to sit in the audience of the presidential debates. In 2012, Jill Stein and Sherry Honkler were held in a black site after being picked up protesting near the front gates of Hofstra University, the same university that had those other debates uh, where Obama and Romney debates were being held. Margaret Flowers was dragged out of a Senate debate in Maryland um, when she was running for Senate there. We have broken the illusion that we live in a democracy at all, because if we did, if the United States said that about another country, that the opposition was being dragged out and imprisoned for trying to be in the debates, we would be going in there, guns blazing immediately. Uh, we would organize regime change. The only difference is that we don't call it the Biden regime. We call it a presidency, but it really is the Biden regime. It was the Trump regime. It was the Obama regime. And we need to talk about these things in those kinds of terms. Um, studies have shown that it's basically an accident if the vast majority of Americans get anything they want from their legislators. While big money interests nearly always get what they want, groups like ALEC, um, not the legislators themselves actually write the legislation. And the legislators are so lazy, they often forget to wipe out that name and, and logo and just pass it off as their own. <laughs> Um, so clearly, neither the Democrats or Republicans are the answer. They're both evil. There's, it doesn't matter what level of government you talk about. They're very much bought. Um, the people who say that they're trying to do good, either they're ladder climbing or they're lazy or they're just, they're not doing a very good job. And if you, if you hear them talk for 10 minutes, most of them, you start to think, hmm, I probably could do a better job than these guys <laughs> or somebody that I know, the people around me who are in the Green Party could probably do a better job than these guys. Um, so I know that a lot of us don't have that experience as public speakers that we feel like, oh, maybe it's, it's a lot to be in an office. But really, I think all of us should be encouraged and we should encourage everybody in our communities who are, you know, just working class, regular people to go for it because we can't possibly be worse than what we've got now. And we've really got nothing to lose because we need to do what we can to be heard. So here's what I think that we can do moving forward. Um, we can always be seen being green. So we should be out in our communities doing what we need to do um, and let everybody know that we are Greens and we're here to stay. We can inject our priorities into public conversations when we go to city council meetings or just in our local groups. We can do that elections work in our committees. There's all these elections that we've run people in and we need people to help us look at all that information of where our people are so that we can get a hold of them and make sure that they know that we're here for them. Because there's actually been, um, especially in Europe, there have been like websites and things where candidates would put up, hey, I'm, um, I'm voting green. I pledge to vote green. And so tons and tons of people would pledge to do it all together. 
So it didn't feel like something that your weird uh, neighbor is doing by themselves, but that there's actually backing of a whole party. Um, so I think that we can do more of that kind of thing where people see that we're all out here. It's not just a singular person doing a singular action, but that we're all working together, um, that we're all greens and it's a multi-million person movement. Um, we can push for the debates and other public spaces to be um, a public, truly public. The Wisconsin Broadcasters Association here is in charge of all the debates. It's a private um, corporation and they can decide to do whatever they like to do. Um, perhaps a nonprofit that is truly nonprofit, like um, the League of Women Voters, could put on debates instead. We could push for the return of the nonpartisan ethics board, which we did in our last race. Push for another thing is push for um, ballot initiatives to be a thing in Wisconsin. That would be a huge change. It would be changing our constitution, but keeping that in the air that we don't actually need our legislators who refuse to do anything for us to um, head all of the conversations that we could actually have more direct democracy and really threaten to, to do more, more direct democracy as well. Um, and just, um, I kind of went out of order on my points, so I think I got them all, but um, really the point is that we should not ever think of ourselves as spoilers. There should be no green in the green party who is worried that our candidates are ruining things for anybody. Um, the Democrats said through this whole election that democracy was on the ballot, as if when you vote for one of the two, you are going to lose democracy. But the Greens have really shattered the whole idea that this two-party duopoly even is a democracy in the first place. Um, we are the protest, but we're also the movement that has something to say. Those two parties have nothing to say. They have nothing for us. So we've moved further. Um, and I think that the more that we move together like this and, and work together, the better we will have a chance at um, actually taking over this system that we would like to implement things like ranked choice voting and be more democratic. So with that, um, I just had one thing that I wanted to share. I, I can't screen share, but I'm going to put this link in the chat. It's a, just a really quick TikTok I saw. So I get, we can end on a really funny note. <laughs> um, but it's, it's like a 30 second clip that, um, really goes with this idea of, um, somebody sent this to me and it's, it's just a funny way of, um, conveying this idea that there is even a democracy and that we have the spoiler issue to begin yeah, with. I don't think it's, I think it's, she's making the decision. I don't know if somebody can just share that to everybody. Um, <laughs> I can share it, but um, does it have any copyrighted material in it? Because um, we had an issue earlier related to a copyright thing with the stream. So uh, I, prefer to avoid that hap happening again because it there's it's just a guy talking there's no music in it if that's the concern um, okay that would just pull it out of the we just have to pull that out. Um, just one moment I just, I just watch it it's very funny i won't try to um replicate it but basically you know the guy says everything sucks then the other guy's like, okay, so vote for the Democrats. And he's like, everything still sucks. And it's like, okay, so vote for Republican Congress. And he's like, everything still sucks. Okay, so vote for a Democratic president. And he's like, everything still sucks. Okay, so vote for Republican Congress. You know, and so it's like a history of, of U.S. elections. And yeah, I mean, it's like that's been my entire life. You know, there's never been a good president. There's never been a good Congress. 
there's never, you know, been a time when people were like, oh, yeah, this government's good. And that's why I was saying, like, in the U.S., we just take it for granted that the party in power is going to lose the midterms because, um, you know, they never do stuff that actually helps the voters. Um, and so people, you know, in the in the two party system, the media is like, OK, well, you know, then vote for the other party to punish the, you know, the party in power. And yeah, I mean, of course, it's all a game. But, um, you know, I, I wanted to respond also to, you know, some of that Barb said, and yeah, you know, I, I agree, obviously, I don't think that the, the Green Party um, is, you know, what's spoiling the US political system, uh, you know, quite the opposite. Um, you know, I do think it's important that we, uh, you know, are able to communicate with uh, people across the political spectrum. And a lot of times you find, you know, when you can actually have like a, a real conversation, this can even happen on social media sometimes, um, you know, that you can actually have like an authentic conversation with someone. And, you know, a lot of times find that, you know, there's sort of perceptions that have been put out there by the media or whoever. And, you know, when we can like address those perceptions, um, then people will say, oh, yeah, actually, you're making a lot more sense than I thought. Um, and I think ranked choice voting is a great example because, you know, say, if, you know, you, you're talking with someone, all they've ever watched is MSNBC, and they're like, oh, we have to vote for the Democrats to stop the Republicans. It's a two party system. You know, I wish they were more progressive, but that's the best that we can get. And then you say, well, why don't we have ranked choice voting so that you could vote for a party that really represented your values and you wouldn't have to worry about them, you know, being a quote unquote spoiler or, you know, quote unquote, wasting your vote. Um, you know, you could, you could vote for a party that cares about peace, justice, democracy, ecology, you know, all these things that, that you care about. And then in my experience, people always say, that sounds great, you know, and then they, it kind of plants a seed and they're like, well, yeah, why aren't the Democrats doing this? You know, they're always saying, oh, we're for democracy. They're always saying, oh, uh, you know, third parties are so bad because, um, they're spoiling the two party system. So why don't they fix the problem? You know, why don't, uh, and you know, I, I find that it's, it's really a conversation starter. And so, you know, of course I, I could, I could sort of put on my like super green hat and say like, I don't care about spoiling the election for these horrible parties. Like they're the ones who spoiled our system. But that, you know, that doesn't always keep the conversation open because people can say, oh, there's too much at stake. We can't have the, oh, the worst person ever who is the current Republican candidate. We can't risk them winning. Um, you know, and to be fair, a lot of these Republican candidates are pretty awful. Um, you know, a lot of Democrats are as well. But um but yeah, I, anyway, my, my point is that, like, I think for me, a lot of it is about skillful communication and kind of like sort of uh, addressing where people are and then finding common ground. And, you know, that's really, I think, how we can, you know, build bridges and, for example, get people like in DSA to say like, hey, yeah, you know, you greens are making a lot of sense. Instead of just being like DSA is sold out because they endorse Democrats. Well, not everyone in DSA is down with that, you know, and there's some people who may have liked that strategy, but now when, you know, they're seeing the results and they're second guessing it, you know? So if we go to them and say, Hey, what about proportional ranked choice voting? So you don't have this, need to, you know, 
tail the Democrats and, you know, try to, you know, fix the two party system from inside or whatever. And they'll say, yeah, that sounds good. So I'll pass with that. All right. Well, it's 4.20 p.m. It, um, is there anyone else who... Okay, James is on stack. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I just wanted to... Um, kind of a newcomer to these parts. <laughs> Wondered if I'm looking at the Wisconsin Green website, what there is um, regarding free speech, because to me that's an area in which the Greens might... Um, attract some people who might be disenchanted with uh, the uh, Democrats and Republicans and um, mainly people who are disenchanted with the Democrats because the Democrats are sort of going on this censorship um, um, binge, which is really disappointing. I don't have to go into the details of that, but, you know, I think Glenn Greenwald and Matt Taibbi and Katie Halper and the experiences of those folks are very instructive. Uh, let's uh, just pick a, you know, uh, any of my folks where I uh, get my media on YouTube or Substack or whatever, chances are they've gotten censored at one point or another. So I think um, a lot of times people go to uh, the Libertarian Party or to go to the Republican Party because they have the uh, um, perception that the Democratic Party does not believe in free speech anymore and is more interested in policing free speech um, in order to en enact their agenda, whether that be um, an agenda of empire or an agenda of um, their uh, social uh, programs or the woke agenda or whatever you, whatever you want to call that. So uh, I feel like um, free speech should be reclaimed by the left. And I'm just wondering what uh, the Green Party has to say about that, because um, certainly there, you know, as Matt, Matt Taibbi has said, you know, 30 years ago, if you believed in free speech, then the left uh, leftists were where you went because they were the ones who were who were funny and who were pushing boundaries and had the cool people on their side, like the George Carlins and people like that. And now the situation is completely flipped. So you get uh, someone uh, like uh, the fellow who uh, just came through UW. Um, there wasn't much about it in the isthmus. The, the guy who... Uh, uh, the guy who did the film about what is a woman, et cetera, Matt, something, I can't remember his name. But anyway, he uh, um, is pushing these boundaries. And there are a lot of these uh, uh, folks who are engaged in free speech who are getting, who the right wing is attracting. And I think the Green Party uh, has an opportunity here. And I'm wondering what you guys may think about that. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump on. Uh, don't see anyone else on stack. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting, uh, very interesting topic because, um, you know, there's like a lot of a lot of issues folded up in this. I mean, what I what I think of you mentioned Glenn Greenwald, Matt Taibbi, Katie Halper. And I think of the whole Russiagate saga and how like we as Greens were really targeted. Um, you know, there was this whole idea that, oh, there was this massive uh, evil Russian attack on our elections. Um, and, you know, some people took it extremely far and got, uh, you know, very conspiratorial. And, you know, then came all these efforts to, uh, you know, go after quote unquote misinformation or disinformation 
um, then it turned out that a, lot, that a lot of the basis of the Russiagate scandal itself was misinformation and disinformation. Um, and, you know, that really seemed to kind of splinter the internet and the media into uh, sort of opposing camps that uh, wouldn't even accept the same facts. So, um, you know, and they would say like, oh yeah, we tolerate free speech, but not misinformation or, uh, you know, not anything that challenges our narrative. Um, I think, you know, for leftists, there's been a lot of debate because, um, you know, on, on the one hand, we are against censorship and censorship is really dangerous. On the other hand, you know, some of the people who are kind of crying the loudest about being censored are pretty reprehensible. Uh, you know, Alex Jones being an example. Um, and yeah, so, and, you know, I, I find Matt Walsh to be pretty reprehensible. I think he, uh, I think he self-identifies as a fascist. Um, and yeah, so, you know, and there's the question of, you know, how do we effectively, I mean, I, I tend to agree with Noam Chomsky in saying that, um, you know, if you don't believe in free speech for people who you disagree with vehemently, then you don't believe in free speech at all. But, you know, I do think that there are complexities to the, uh, to the discussion. Um, obviously you can't have people calling for violence, um, and there certainly are people who are, you know, inciting either violence or harassment or whatnot against, um, you know, against folks. And, you know, it's one thing to, you know, criticize a public figure. Uh, you know, it's another thing when, you know, for example, just regular people for some reason become Internet famous and then get, you know, death threats and all that stuff. So, you know, I, th I think there's some very complex questions, but, but yeah, you know, in general, I think the trend towards censorship and information control, especially on the internet is really concerning. Um, and yeah, you know, I agree the democratic party has really embraced censorship, um, in, you know, it might be surprising to some it's, probably not surprising to many of us, <laughs> uh, you know, considering that they've been preaching about saving democracy for years uh, while they, um, you know, try to totally stomp out our democratic rights as the Greens. So, uh, so yeah, no, it's a really interesting and complex issue. Um, and yeah, I, I think particularly, you know, as, as we see like now with the war in Ukraine, um, you know, the whole Russiagate thing, I think, was sort of a very sinister prelude towards trying to have complete information control, um, you know, in the service of uh, an imperial agenda that could get us all killed. So, um, so yeah. Well, and, and there just isn't any uh, debate on the networks at all. I mean, that's that's nothing new, really. But I mean, I'm an I'm I'm. I'm I have two main uh, uh, goals if I help, if whatever I, I can do to help you guys. One would be organizing and, and, and to get more people. And the second would be uh, focus on empire because the, the natural question that people have when um, people sort of read the Greens platform is, okay, well, where are you going to get the, where are you going to get the money? And the, um, there needs to be a rejoinder to that. And the rejoinder needs to be more than just sort of, oh, we're going to tax the rich more. I mean, to me, the answer has to be you cut the Pentagon budget. If you don't cut the Pentagon budget and you don't have the details for that ready, then people, you're just going to, in my opinion, you're just going to be spinning, spinning your wheels. And so I think, you know, having a focus on empire and having people ready, readily, um, available um, for intellectual, uh, people's intellectual curiosity. People say, oh, are, are, are you a Putin puppet? Okay, well then is, is Tulsi Gabbard a Putin puppet? Is Douglas McGregor a Putin puppet? Is, 
you know, there are a lot of people about the guy, the joint chief, joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Who's is he a Putin puppet? You know, there are a lot of people who have come out against this. Uh, you know, uh, you don't have to go with Medea Benjamin or you know um, people who are traditionally uh, anti-imperial. Um, but yeah, I mean, we we don't have freedom of speech on the airwaves, and and that's a big problem. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I, I would hope that. Um, there, there would be some uh, openness to that. And I hope that, you know, when there are openings on the media, such as Glenn Greenwald going on Tucker Carlson, people are open to that, you know? And um, if Jackson Hinkle gets on Tucker Carlson, we should applaud Jackson Hinkle, you know, in my opinion. Same with Glenn Greenwald. You know, I, when, when Medea Benjamin came across came through Madison a month ago, she said, well, I don't know whether to go on Tucker Carlson or not. I mean, I think they probably have an invitation to her. And I said, well, I hope you do go. But unfortunately, those of us on the quote unquote left, we sort of want to discount people like, oh, that's Tucker Carlson. That's bad. You know, um, as Jimmy Dore said, I'll, I'll lie with anyone who's not uh, fight against nuclear war, period. <laughs> so that's kind of where I am. Yeah. On. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, it's a very complicated issue, but, um, you know, the the whole idea that like, oh, if you if you go on Fox News, then all of a sudden you're endorsing everything that they've ever done. And, you know, we had people uh, say that when Jill went on Tucker Carlson, I said, OK, so Bernie Sanders went on went on Fox News just recently for a town hall. Um, you know, do you do you have all the same criticisms of Bernie Sanders? Um, and, you know, because when, when Bernie went on Fox news, people said, Oh, wow, that's, that's such great outreach to, you know, go and speak to people who aren't reached by MSNBC and CNN. Um, and yeah. And, and the other thing is, you know, Jill Stein would go on CNN. She would go on MSNBC. Uh, and yeah, you know, she used to go on RT. She would go on, uh, pretty much any media, you know, with an audience with, with very few exceptions, you know, there are some that are so kind of clearly activist media that, that are just bad news and you don't want to, you know, so there are complexities, you know, I, um, but um, yeah, you know, and then she stopped getting invited to CNN and MSNBC, you know, they would, they would talk about her, they would smear her, but they wouldn't invite her to respond. So, yeah, because, you know, as Glenn Greenwald has pointed out, it becomes this no win game where they say you're on Fox News, you're evil. It's like, OK, well, then bring me on MSNBC to talk about these things. And, you know, they won't. But then they can say, well, you know, he's he's evil because he went on Fox News, so he shouldn't be on MSNBC. Um, and, yeah, you know, it, it really is a problem, you know, for for many reasons. Uh, and one of them is, you know, we're becoming so polarized that people can't talk to, you know, anyone who, who they disagree with. And yeah. And, you know, there are people who I really vehemently disagree with and, and some of them who I think, you know, are, are doing a lot of harm. Um, but, you know, as a green, I, I think like, yeah, I should have the right to protest those people, maybe vehemently. Um, but, you know, I, I believe in like nonviolence and I do believe, you know, people should have civil rights. Like if they, if they, um, you know, have different opinions, then they should be able to express that somehow. Um, yeah, but anyway. Van Jones worked with the Koch brothers and Newt Gingrich a few years ago on prison reform. Does that mean we should stop talking to Van Jones? You know, it's just silly in my opinion. And it turns a lot of people off because who would otherwise, you know, you know because a, a lot of times for people like that, it's almost like uh, politics has become religion where as soon as you're sort of an apostate and you talk to the wrong people, then you, you you're shunned and so forth. And that's just not good organizing. In my opinion. Yeah, it's virtue signaling. It's virtue signaling in lieu of politics, but I see Barbara's on stack. So I don't want to hog the mic. Barb, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? 
uh, feedback. Okay, cool. Better. Um, I just wanted oh, to turn the sound on for you. To say, I, I can hear. Okay. Anyway, um, yeah, I wanted to say that I really agree with what James is talking about. Um, I think free speech is really important. Um, there used to be a lot more left libertarianism in the party. Um, I think since 2016, there's been a lot like a, a group of, or just kind of a, a direction in the party that is um has just kind of gotten a little bit of the trump derangement syndrome sort of a, a thing where trump is the worst and maybe we are you know spoilers in some way or another some of our own party members have reached out to us um especially in 2020 about our candidate even being on the ballot um saying that we were reprehensible for ha um even having a candidate um and these are longtime Greens that have reached out to say this. The propaganda is extremely thick um, and it's it's hard to navigate it, especially if you are one of these people who watches a lot of MSNBC all day or CNN or any of these channels and all of your friends are doing it and they're all saying it, um, people that have been activists around you for a long time. So I don't blame anybody um, in the party or outside the party for really having these knee jerk reactions that we just need to shut down all conversation about whatever A, B or C, um, that we can't even have the conversation, that we can't even have anybody who's a representative of such and such idea around. Um, I think that, sunlight usually is the best disinfectant for ideas and for movements that are not very good for us that, you know, when, when we hear about how people could be stochastic, um, fascists or whatever they call them, that they're like secret Nazis and fascists or whatever they are, that people can tell they're not, mo people are not dumb. They can hear what people are saying and they can pick out that such and such is not a good idea for society, that they can hear what it is that is a bad idea, I think. We don't have to protect people from hearing different ideas, even if somebody has said that this is, this is a terrible person. We should be able to argue on the merits. That's um, that something is a bad or a good idea. Um, that should be easy and clear for us. And usually, it's very easy and very effective whenever you argue your point on a topic. So I, I uh, wholeheartedly agree that having conversations should not be um, demonized, that people should not be demonized, um, and that we should really think about how we talk in um, through like, what are the fallacies that are argumentative fallacies rather than who's a bad person, who's a good person, what's not a good idea for us uh, versus what's a great idea and argue on those, those points instead. Um, so the, the thing that I have been working on to kind of bring that left libertarianism back is this uh, whole health freedom and green liberation society. Um, it's not, um, it's not a, an official Green Party thing yet, but I think that it would be a good idea. So anybody who's interested can still contact me about that. Um, and yeah, I, I agree that we should be pushing in the media in every space to get green ideas out there. Pass. Yeah, thanks, Barb. Yeah, I, I put myself on stack just to say, um, you know, since didn't mention before that, um, you know, we are past our like official meeting time. And at this point, uh, you know, folks can feel free to, to stick around and talk a little more. Um, but you don't have to, you know, people can feel free to leave. Uh, you know, we are done with official business. Um, like we said, you know, we'll be sending out uh, ballots electronically to all uh, you know, dues paying members in good standing uh, to vote on the, um, uh, you know, official positions, 
bylaws amendment, platform amendments, et cetera. Um, yeah, so, uh, but yeah, people can feel free to stick around. You know, I, I probably will stick around for a few more minutes, um, you know, if, if anyone wants to keep talking. But yeah, you can feel free to go. And, um, you know, before anyone leaves, just, you know, thanks everyone for being here. And um, yeah, I, I think this was a really good meeting. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'm going to transfer host over to you. Um, or if somebody else, uh, maybe Tom wants to. Yeah, I'll, uh, take, it. I'll take it for right now. Okay. Um, Cause yeah, I've got a, I've got something going on at five, so I got to kind of move a little bit. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Sam. Yep, thanks, See everybody. Have a, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Have a good night. Thanks, Sam. I also have something going on. So uh, thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the evening. Thanks, Melissa. Um, Tom Stack. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I was wondering if uh, James could kind of introduce himself and tell us what part of Wisconsin he's from and how he found out about us and, and some background, because I'm not familiar. Thanks. Pass. Sure. Um, yeah, I lived in Madison for the better part of 20 years. Uh, I'm a social worker. Um, and I voted for Nader in 2000 and Jill Stein. So I've been supporter of the Green Party, but I haven't um, uh, been involved per se um, until now. Like I said, I mean, I think the Ukraine war is sort of, it's kind of in my wheelhouse because it's so transparently corrupt and destructive. So it's, uh, if you can't organize behind that, then uh, I don't know what you can organize behind. Um, I guess, like I said, I'm interested in opportunities to help build um, membership. Uh, I, I see no reason why I can't organize for both organizations at the same time, considering that both of them, they have similar goals uh, and there's a lot of, yeah, overlap. So um as far as what, I, what else I've done, I mean, I led a union campaign at my workplace in 2014 um, when I was working at a methadone clinic. I have a clinical social work license. I have an alcohol and drug counseling license. I'm an equine therapist in private practice. Um, and as far as, yeah, my news sources, I already said most of them, but, you know, I'm sort of an old school, Tom Skies in type. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, the other, I, we had brought up the Ukraine. I mean, frankly, uh, I had the same attitude about the Ukraine war. It's like, this is World War III. And how can we not be focusing on it? We did agree that we all supported negotiations. I get, I guess at the national level, I'm sorry, I'm not on top of the Green Party list, but I think that's true, Dave. And I think that's Thing. But I think more involvement. Now the Milwaukee Peace Movement had a similar division, but we had some people out on the street against the Ukraine war. And then um, the emphasis shift, shifted back to Yemen, but it, it's a meat grinding process and it, just grinding down those Ukrainians. It's just so sad. I mean, it's to my understanding, it's more than 100,000 dead and counting and it's gonna uh, that's so. what doug mcgregor says yeah that's where yeah, i respect mcgregor and ray mcgovern and um mm -hmm. so the mersheimer and stephen cohen i know he's dead but yeah there's a number of people i follow and yeah it sounds like you have good good sources and i feel like we encroached um going uh, eastward, you know, country by country, right up to the Russian border. And uh, Putin, will, but, you know, I'm getting into the details now. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're preaching to the choir, I and mean, we seem to agree on this. But yeah, I mean, it, it's, there's, there should be an opportunity, uh, even in this sort of um, 
post-election season to organize people. I'm, I'm looking on your website. I don't see flyers. Maybe I'm just looking in the wrong place. Um, but I'm happy to get out there and, and try to build the membership. I just don't know where the flyers are. And it helps to have a like a, a meeting, like a regular monthly meeting. I don't know. Maybe you've already covered that, but... Um, yeah, we, um, so I can that uh, real quick. Um, and I also, I put a link in the chat. So that's the recently passed proposal, uh, from on the national committee from the green party peace action committee. Um, just putting out our, our statement on the war in Ukraine and, you know, basically, Saying you know we we oppose this approach of um, you know fueling the conflict with weapons you know etc you know sort of all out sanctions and economic war plus you know refusing to engage in diplomacy so but anyway um, yeah, you can check good. that out you know I, I think you'd be interested I also wanted to invite you to um, become a dues paying member. Um, and, you know, as I think we mentioned before, but I'm not sure if you were here at that time, um, you know, today is the deadline to, you know, join as a dues paying member if, if you would like to uh, vote in, you know, if, if you'd like to be sent a ballot you know, and, and vote. Yeah, on. that's fine, that's fine. Where, where do you do that? Contribute? Uh, so, I, I put the link to our, our contribute page and okay yeah so it's, you know it's it's like a sliding scale system so you can see that and and yeah so the the Four Lakes Green Party you know we do have uh, monthly meetings we've been moving them around a little bit trying to find a you know the best time um, and yeah but. Um, you know, why don't we connect about that? I'll, I'll give you my email and- I think I, I, think I may have it, but go, please, yeah. I like oh, we do, yeah. But, but yeah, I'll, um, you know, you can just copy it down there. And yeah, um, so yeah, let's connect about, you know, the Four Lakes Green Party and getting involved. Um, yeah, There's also the, yeah, the, the, the dinners, is that what you're saying? The uh, um, are you saying there's like monthly dinners? No, no, monthly meetings. Monthly meetings. Okay. Thanks, all. Yeah. Error occurred while processing this form. Employer can't be blank. I'm not sure if that went through. Um, did you see the employer box? Yeah, I did. I just, I'm not sure whether. It worked too. Uh, okay, I'll try this again. Now, your info. Okay, let's try this. Oh, employer. Okay, there we are. I thought it was like an either or. <laughs> uh, Okay, so we'll just do this and then all right, good. Okay. Yeah, it looks like we went through. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, I mean if uh there's what is like if there's events that you guys have in mind that you think would be a good to um, establish a presence at? I mean, I, I'm I, I sort of rely more on the principle of attraction rather than promotion. I mean, I'm someone who has led and like I said, an organizing campaign at the at, at my workplace. Um, so I'm and I'm fairly militant in my political views, as you can tell by the media sources. So I'm not averse to getting up there and shouting down a legislator, but I don't think that's very effective strategy. And I think that's probably what, what turns a lot of people off. It may get some news and some clickbait, but 
think we need to build our own party in order to get people to uh, not just view us as an irritation or an annoyance. So it all comes with numbers, you know, and uh, so if there's ways that in which, you know, uh, having a regular meeting at a library or at a, you know, coffee shop or whatever would help bring people out and uh, leafleting, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Great. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm, you know, pretty fried after today and <laughs> staying up late last night working on in the uh, proportional rank choice voting presentation. But yeah, we should definitely talk soon about, you know, ways to get more involved. And um, yeah, we, in case you're interested, you know, I did mention uh, earlier that we, you know, we are doing this event tomorrow. Uh, partnering I didn't with see that. Yeah, that's on the Isthmus. Yes. And I highly yeah. encourage you guys to to put whatever events you have on the Isthmus calendar, if they're not already, because that's a really important way to get people out in uh, the Madison area. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so, yeah, if, if you're interested, you know, definitely feel free to, to drop in there. I think it'll be a good events with some good folks um and you know it's always nice to have more greens showing up um but yeah you know either way we'll you know let's definitely talk soon absolutely and, uh, all right cool well thanks thanks for coming out. nice to meet you have a good Thank night you. great you work too. take care bye Thank you. Yeah, you too. Bye.